As people kind of filter into their seats in the museum, I wanted to welcome you all here. My name is Karen Archer Perry, and I wanted to welcome you to America's Digital Inclusion Summit. We are so glad you're here, and we're so glad you've been with us for every step of the way as we pull together this national broadband plan. In addition to this full room we have here at the museum, we also have community viewings happening in five communities across the country, one in Akron, Detroit, Miami, Philadelphia, and Minneapolis, St. Paul. So we'd like to welcome that viewing audience as well. And we have virtual attendants who are, jo virtual attendants who are joining online, and we appreciate their support as well. Before the program starts, I need to address a few administrative items for you. The Knight Foundation and the FCC share a common interest in informed, engaged communities. So please continue to be engaged in this process and in this event. You can join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag BBPlan. That's hashtag, hashtag BBPlan. Later on, we'll have a question and answer period. You can tweet your questions in to us, or you can send them via email at newmedia New media at FCC.gov, or if you're here in the museum room, you can use the tactile experience of filling out an index card and passing it to somebody in the hallway, in the aisles. I also wanted to point out that we have a very full agenda and we're not going to do long introductions for most of the speakers, but there are bios in, in your package and you're welcome to look at those. If you're, on the, if you're online, um, you can access all that information on the website. And I also wanted to remind you that at break time, do visit the Inclusion Showcase. We have eight wonderful programs from around the, pro around the country of people who are already doing broadband adoption programs in their community and making a huge difference to bridge the digital divide. If you're watching online, you can, all, you can go to broadband.gov slash blog to get to all of these links, including those descriptions. Those of you who came to the museum have picked up a USB or a thumb drive with a great set of information. It includes um, a number of adoption reports. I wanted to um, uh, point out the one by John Horrigan from the F FCC, which includes um, trends in adoption as well as barriers and things, and, and it really does direct much of our inclusion uh, recommendations here. The Institute of Museums and Library Services has a new report on computer usage in libraries, and I think you'll find that one interesting. And the Knight Commission report on the information needs of communities and society is also included. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a visionary in the field of media, access, and community. But more than a visionary, a civic change maker. Alberto Ibarguen, President and CEO of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Thank you. I, I'm not sure, as I straighten my, my glasses, that I really deserve to be called a visionary, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see you here. Welcome to this America's Digital Inclusion Summit. I really believe this is an important day, a harbinger of an America where all citizens have access to a digital political, social, and economic society as surely and as generally as we have come in our country to enjoy access to the public square, the shopping mall, or the community center. As many of you know, Knight Foundation represents the legacy of two brothers, John S. and James L. Knight who started as the owners of one paper, the Akron Beacon Journal, and grew it into a company that became, in its day, the largest newspaper publisher in the country. They didn't so much create a newspaper company as they formed a company of newspapers. They knew that each community they served had its own unique character and, and needs, and that a newspaper that reflected Miami would not work in Detroit, and that Charlotte was neither Macon nor Philadelphia. Their true business was informing communities and reflecting their individuality. Jack Knight believed that a good news organization should inform and illuminate the minds of the readers so that the people might determine their own true interests and thus be able to act on them. That thought was spoken more than 60 years ago, but the words are wonderfully modern for a world learning again about the wisdom of the crowd and the uses of technology to capture it. 
Two years ago, guided by that belief in informed, engaged communities, we partnered with the Aspen Institute to create the Knight Commission on the Information Needs of Communities in a Democracy, a panel of 15 smart and insightful Americans. <clears throat> they were asked to articulate the information needs of communities in a democracy, to describe how well we're meeting those needs today, and to propose public policy that might get us from where we are to where they thought we should be. The Knight Commission was emphatically not a collection of media experts, nor were they asked to fix or even particularly focus on the problems of existing media. Instead, they were asked to think about communities first and then work back. Last October, Aspen Institute published the Knight Commission's report under the title Informing Communities, Sustaining Democracies in the Digital Age. They made <clears throat> many recommendations regarding government transparency and found that in a democracy, reliable, localized information is essential to the civic health of a community as surely as good streets and clean water, and that information is and increasingly will continue to be delivered electronically. If information is a core need in the society, and if information is to be delivered digitally, then logically to have a chance to be a fully participating citizen, one must have digital access. And therefore, the Commission concluded it is essential that we support universal broadband access and new media literacy so that citizens may be informed and engaged going forward. Every one of us who participated in that process has been heartened that the Federal Communication Commission has taken so seriously the call for universal access for all Americans. They've discussed it. They've named a senior advisor to the chairman to consider these issues. They are about to issue policy guidelines that will lead the country in the direction of broadband access for all of our citizens, and they'll have a major say in how the first $7 billion, I say the first $7 billion of stimulus money will be spent building out the network. Indeed, but for their interest, we wouldn't be here today, and that is a very good thing. <clears throat> We had, I'm actually from Miami. We're not used to applauses in the middle of speeches. Uh, <laughs> that's not to say that you can't express yourself however you like. We, we, at, we at Knight Foundation believe that you cannot have a healthy American democracy with only 60 percent of Americans having access to key measures of commercial, civic, and social communication. And that's the actual figure we live with today. That means that almost 40 percent of Americans, urban, poor, rural, or, old, or elderly, are on the other side of that digital divide. Imagine if 40 percent of Americans did not have paved roads or running water, electricity. Broadband access is no less a key to the active participation of people in a modern society. A recent poll by Pew confirms that while television is still the dominant provider of news to Americans, the Internet has surpassed newspapers as a primary way for Americans to get news, with many connected users taking advantage of non-traditional consumption methods, such as social media postings, personalized news feeds, and getting their news on mobile devices. Every indicator suggests that we can't wait to build the digital equivalent of President Eisenhower's interstate highway system, or for that matter, to build the railroad that connected the country in the Lincoln administration. I'm thrilled that you're here and that you're engaged in this. I'm thrilled that other foundations like Ford and Pew and MacArthur uh, are also engaged. Some approach this issue as we do uh, from the perspective of journalism and civics. Others find it compelling as a matter of economic and social equality. Others to study social trends or to help build the country's infrastructure. I say welcome to all of them and welcome as partners. In that spirit, I'd like to announce a partnership between the Federal Communications Commission and Knight Foundation, the Knight FCC Apps for Inclusion Challenge. The concept is really pretty straightforward. We believe in transparent government and universal digital access. To 
encourage transparency, we'll offer cash prizes uh, to software developers who can invent the best technological solutions to create easier online access to government services and information. Citizens can already apply for a job at McDonald's. They can learn the identity of a song playing, it on, playing on the radio with their mobile device. We believe they should just as easily be able to track their congresswoman's voting record, receive updates on emergency services, um, or see a list of their mayor's uh, campaign contributions. Details on that contest will be forthcoming. My colleague, Bahia Ramos, is here today, and uh, she will either tell you the new rules or invent them as you ask her questions. <laughs> When President Eisenhower supported the interstate highway system, he really didn't care whether you drove a Ford or a Cadillac or whether you drove for commerce uh, or for pleasure. He cared that the nation be connected because this made social, political, and economic sense. It was highways in the 50s, it's digital broadband today, it made sense then, and it makes sense now. I hope you'll join us to put in this push to include all Americans. It's now my pleasure to introduce the person who's going to make all of this happen. Um, the, 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 um, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Julius Janikowski, truly is the man whose vision, uh, whose courage, and whose commitment to inclusion um, and to universal digital access, broadband access, um, uh, has brought us here today. Chairman Janikowski has two decades of experience in public service and the private sector private, prior to his appointment. He served more than 10 years working in the technology industry as an executive and an entrepreneur. Uh, his confirmation as FCC chairman returns him to, a, to the agency where from 94 to 97 he served as chief counsel to FCC chairman Reed Hunt, who, by the way, was a member of the Knight Commission on Information Needs of Communities. Please welcome uh, our friend, our, our hero of the day, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Julius Jenikowski. Alberto, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm here today actually as a setup man, uh, 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 which I, a role that I, uh, I am coming to like. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. It is uh, terrific to be back here at the museum. Two months ago, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton gave an important speech about internet freedom and the power of the internet to transform lives around the globe. That speech was here. Today, we're back to focus on making sure that the benefits of the Internet are enjoyed by everyone here at home. We're privileged uh, to be joined, of course, by Alberto Ibarguen, uh, who introduced Secretary Clinton at that speech. Thank you, Alberto and the Knight Foundation, for co-sponsoring this event with the FCC on digital inclusion, for all the tremendous work that Knight has done to promote a vibrant media and healthy democracy. Uh, thank you for participating with us in the Apps for Inclusion Challenge, which we're very excited about. Uh, let me uh, very happily thank uh, some distinguished speakers who have joined us today. Our Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan, uh, who I will introduce in a moment. Uh, we have a number of leading members of Congress here today to speak. Congressman Ed Markey, Javier Becerra, Doris Matsui, Congressman Lee Terry, who uh, uh, has actually uh, given the FCC one of the best examples of the importance of universal broadband. Many of you have heard me tell this story, but in his district in Diller, Nebraska, there was a small uh, butcher, a small meat company, that uh, was able to take advantage of broadband to expand its market, to sell its products beyond the little city, increase tremendously, in fact, increase its number of employees from four to 40 but only when Diller got broadband. Uh, it's a great story. Uh, in, many ca in many ways, it's the exception around the country. It should be the rule. Uh, I'm pleased that my FCC colleagues, Commissioner Copps, Clyburn, and Baker, are here today. I'll return to them in a minute. And uh, thank you to the members of the FCC's broadband team for organizing today's summit, and more important, for your remarkable work over the past several months. As I suspect many of you know, Last year, Congress and the President charged the FCC with developing a strategy to bring high-speed Internet 
to all Americans. The FCC will deliver that plan to Congress in seven days, or as the broadband team would put it, 168 hours, 42 minutes, and 16 seconds, not that they're counting. I kid about how hard the staff at the FCC has been working, but their achievements are no joke. The work the agency has performed in this endeavor is truly unprecedented. This has been the most open, transparent, and data-driven process in FCC history. The FCC and the broadband team have conducted over 40 public workshops and hearings streamed live on the Internet with over 350 panelists. Uh, we've issued 30 public notices, reviewed over 70,000 pages of subsequent responses, posted almost 200 entries on the broadband.gov blog, which have generated more than 11,000 comments for our proceeding, which our lawyers helped us make sure could be part of the official record of the broadband uh, proceeding. Most important, the broadband team has translated all of this hard work into an ambitious and smart plan for U.S. global leadership in high-speed Internet that will create jobs and spur economic growth, unleash new waves of innovation and investment, improve education, health care, energy efficiency, public safety, and the vibrancy of our democracy, a plan to ensure that broadband extends real opportunity to all Americans. Why is this so important? The work of our broadband team has brought some vital points into focus. As important as broadband is to our prosperity and opportunity, the U.S. is lagging behind globally on key metrics when it comes to broadband. Communities inside the U.S. have fallen behind on broadband. Rural, minorities, low income, seniors, the disabled, tribal communities, all with much lower rates of adoption than the national average. And meanwhile, the cost of digital exclusion is high and growing higher every day, especially in the new economy, especially in these economic times. I'm grateful that Commissioners Michael Copps and Meredith Baker are here participating in the summit. I thank them for their hard work on issues of high-speed Internet access and inclusion. I want to extend particular thanks today to Commissioner Mignon Clyburn, who will be delivering today's keynote address on inclusion. Before joining the FCC, Commissioner Clyburn spent decades giving a voice to the voiceless, first as the publisher of a small newspaper that served minority communities, and later as the head of South Carolina's Public Service Commission. Commissioner Clyburn has been a fierce advocate at the FCC for inclusion, and I'm so pleased that she'll be delivering this important speech today that lays out the National Broadband Plan's key goals and recommendations to increase broadband adoption and usage, to ensure, in short, that the plan meets the vital goal of digital inclusion and tackles the growing costs of digital exclusion. But now we will hear from our first honored guest of the day, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan. Secretary Donovan has said of his agency, quote, our goal is to ensure that every child in America has the same opportunity. And he said, and I quote again, it's not about government being too big or too small. It's about government being the right kind of partner that can help places arrive at the right kind of solutions more efficiently and more effectively. Unquote. Government that promotes opportunity for all Americans and that does it efficiently and effectively, that's exactly what drives our national broadband plan and why we're so privileged to be joined today by Secretary Donovan and why we're so pleased that the Secretary and HUD are participating in an important initiative in connection with the broadband plan. Many of you know that before being named HUD Secretary, Sean Donovan led New York City's Housing Department, where he implemented the largest municipal affording housing plan in U.S. history, building and preserving 165,000 units, becoming in the process one of, if not the most respected state or local housing official. You may not know that Secretary Donovan is a trained architect, which is not something that the Secretary and I have in common. Here's what we do have in common. In the 1990s, we each worked at the agencies that last year we were each fortunate to be asked to lead. Be careful where you go to work. And we both still get carded 
when buying alcohol. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Sean Donovan. Thank you, Julius. Uh, as you can now see, uh, I fear I get carded more often than Julius does, but uh, we can compare data and notes on that sometime. We're both pretty data-driven. Uh, we, can, we can have a little competition about that. Um, what Julius didn't mention uh, that we do have in common, while he wasn't at architecture school, uh, we were at graduate school at the same time. And that is when, uh, for me, the legend of Julius Janikowski began to build. Uh, I had one of my closest friends at law school with him, followed him to the FCC, followed him into the private sector. And I've been hearing all along through the last few decades, this is this amazing guy, Julius Janikowski. He's doing incredible things uh, everywhere he's, he's gone. And it really has been one of the great pleasures, not only of this work that we're talking about today, but of the last year for me, to get to know Julius better and to be able to work so closely with him. And the thing that I found that we share on some fundamental level, though the work that we do is quite different in many ways, is that we both fundamentally see our work as not just about the nuts and bolts, whether it's in housing, the bricks and mortar, the policies and programs, uh, or at the FCC, the similar uh, side of the the day-to-day -day work for Julius, but fundamentally we see our work as a gateway to opportunity, that the, the things that we do are fundamental to delivering on the promise of this nation and the promise of opportunity. And so for him, he understands that in the age of high-speed internet and constant connectivity, whether it's managing a bank account, keeping in touch with your family, or as Alberto reminded us so eloquently just now, simply reading the newspaper, opening the doors of opportunity to every American depends on technology like never before. That is fundamentally how I see our work at HUD and housing more broadly. Think about the fact, and we all know this to be true, that when you choose a home, you don't just choose a home. You choose schools for your children. You choose access to retail and a broad range of other services. You choose public safety. And perhaps most importantly, you choose access to decent jobs uh, in accessible distances from where you live. Too often today, we can predict the life outcomes of children by the zip code that they grow up in. And that, in America today, is simply not right. And we must use this opportunity that we're talking about today and all of the other work we do to fundamentally right that wrong. That's why for families living in the neighborhoods of the most concentrated poverty and segregation, we have worked within this administration to ensure that we broaden the choices those families have about where they live and to ensure real choice for those families that we must begin to remake those neighborhoods of the most concentrated poverty and segregation into neighborhoods of opportunity, what we call choice neighborhoods. Critical to both of these efforts is increasing access to broadband. Think about the fact that in total, 9 million of our lowest income and most vulnerable citizens live in some kind of federally assisted housing. Nearly half are children, almost a million and a half are seniors, and nearly 1 million of those residents have some form of disability that stands in the way of their access to opportunity. With broadband, we have an opportunity to use HUD housing as a platform to drive a broad range of other outcomes. With broadband, a child's ability to learn is not lim limited solely by where their school is located or the resources available at that school. With broadband, seniors and persons with disabilities can be in control of their health care, from knowing where they can get the best care to being able to get their prescriptions filled without what can often be uh, enormously difficult trips uh, to a location to get that prescription filled. With broadband, families can find better housing opportunities than they otherwise wouldn't have known about without that broadband. This is to say nothing about the fact that within a matter of years, uh, as Alberto reminded us, 
many Americans will be getting virtually all of their news and information online. And perhaps most importantly of all, people looking for jobs in this enormously dif difficult economic climate can find out where jobs are available and how to get them. This is particularly important for minority communities. A recent FCC survey found that 83% of African American broadband users and 68% of Hispanic broadband users have used the internet to search or apply for a job. So the connection between broadband and housing policy is not only a natural fit, it's essential to building the economy of the 21st century. The question is how do we do this? You and I both know about the barriers that face low-income households, from the cost of buying computers to the cost of monthly internet service, even if we assume that there is uh, the wiring to their buildings and their, to their units to get service. Uh, and, and Alberta talked eloquently about the way that this can be uh, what the expansion and creation of the internet, uh, interstate highway system was to the 20th century. But we also need, while we attack these barriers, we also need to focus on the barriers that stop folks from using that technology to their benefit. In other words, it is not just about the hardware, about the wiring, uh, about the, the computers themselves. It's also about the barriers to actually utilizing and benefiting from the technology. And we need to attack that fundamentally in three different ways. First of all, we need to make sure that we do local outreach that educates people on the specific ways that technology can improve their lives. Second, we need digital literacy training to get people comfortable with the technology and how to use it. And third, we need workforce development and financial literacy training so that they can get the most out of it to enhance opportunity in their lives. The federal government can't do this alone. We need to work in partnership with the nonprofit and private sectors. That's one of the fundamental recommendations of the National Broadband Plan, to build partnerships that harness resources and commitments from nonprofits and private industry, to bring down the cost of computers and monthly service, to provide free training and applications that help people access educational, employment, and other opportunities available through broad broadband, and to partner with other federal agencies like HUD that serve low-income people who lack these opportunities. Let me talk for a moment about why these partnerships are so important and so powerful. Uh, while I may look too young uh, for you to believe it, uh, I was at the 1977 World Series game in the South Bronx where Howard Co Cosell famously declared, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. And I saw firsthand what it meant for not only New York City, but the entire nation to be witnessing what we thought was the collapse and even the death of our central cities at that point. Uh, it, it was so desperate that we had neighborhoods surrounding uh, Yankee Stadium that literally lost 75% of their population in 10 years. While many people wrote off those neighborhoods, beginning with a group called the Mid Bronx Desperados, a locally based nonprofit that literally shipped overnight in secret homes across the George Washington Bridge to start placing them in a, a neighborhood called Charlotte Gardens that was one of the most distressed that Jimmy Carter and then President Ronald, uh, candidate Ronald Reagan had visited to declare it like Dresden after World War II, uh, the hardest hit neighborhood in America. Groups like the Mid Bronx Desperados began house by house, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, rebuilding that community. And if you go back to the new Yankee Stadium today, what you see is a thriving neighborhood, still one of the poorest communities in America, but a community that's been rebuilt with access to opportunity, to decent schools. All of it started not by some grand federal government program, not started uh, by uh, even local government, which became a, a strong partner, but driven largely by the emergence of locally-based community development corporations that started a revolution in housing 
to the point where today our most creative housing developers and in some cases our most important civic institutions in low-income neighborhoods are not government institutions, not for-profit institutions, but nonprofit CDCs. We need, if we are going to be successful in creating access and opportunity uh, in those lowest income communities, we need to engage those private sector partners, the for-profits, but also fundamentally engage that third sector of nonprofits who can be our partners uh, and help us find the best ways to open the doors to opportunity in those communities. So whether it's in the South Bronx and other central cities or in rural America, we need to engage these partners like never before. By bringing broadband into the homes of every American, including in federally assisted housing, we can not only give hope to millions of households, we can create a geography of opportunity where our choices are never limited or our futures determined by the zip code that we grow up in. That's what this effort is about, and that's why I'm proud to be working with Julius and so many other partners to take on these challenges with our nonprofit and private partners in the months to come and to be successful in the years before us to remake opportunity across this country. Thank you so much for being here today. I look forward to our partnership. Thank you, Julius, for all your leadership. What did you use when you speak to, to tell people to pay? Thank you, Secretary Donovan. And I want to introduce Commissioner Meredith Atwell Baker. Um, terrific, terrific. Mr. Secretary, those were great remarks. We really appreciate your valuable partnership. Um, it's great to have you here and great for everything that you're doing. Uh, we too have something in common that we benefit from the great leadership of Chairman Janikowski. So um, we all share that. We are very grateful to your leadership and we're helpful you, that your ideas and um, coordination with across this great government will bring broadband to all of America. So thank you. Um, I'm pleased to participate here today. This is a really important event and I would like to thank our co-host Alberto and the Knight Foundation for helping us bring all of you together. As you know, last year, and as you've heard, last year Congress gave us this very ambitious goal that uh, has challenged us both critically and creatively to explore the ways in which broadband really could improve nearly every aspect of the ways in which Americans live. Our task really recognizes that today broadband is the enabling technology for everything from the future of education and health care to smart grid energy and public safety and, of course, housing. Uh, from an economic standpoint, broadband is essential for restoring sustained economic growth, opportunity, and prosperity, and for maintaining America's competitiveness in the 21st century. Americans who aren't participating in this revolution risk being left behind. Our nation's broadband providers have really invested aggressively to deploy current generation broadband to well over 90% of the U.S. population and continue to invest in next generation innovations. While deployment is a critical part of the broadband puzzle, consumers cannot benefit from the transformative benefits of broadband from economic development, social engagement, political participation, and more if they do not use it. The Commission's work has found that despite widespread deployment, nearly a third of American households have not embraced the broadband revolution, and that even lower among de demographic groups. We have found that like our diverse nation, there are many different reasons why some choose not to adopt, sometimes many reasons in combination. We are here today to highlight some of the recommendations of the National Broadband Plan to address broadband adoption and to increase digital inclusion. In the brief time I have this morning, I would like to spotlight the role of private enterprises in adoption efforts. Just as broadband providers have invested to offer broadband to our communities, American companies and nonprofits have supported adoption initiatives that have or promised to bring the benefits of broadband to new users across the country. As the National Broadband Plan recognizes, public-private partnerships can be a key path to working cooperatively towards common goals of digital inclusion. These programs can be important tools to help us learn more about how we can turn to today's non-adopters and make them into tomorrow's internet fanatics. 
They can help us figure out how to best leverage both private and limited government resources. I want to commend industry adoption efforts to date and encourage ongoing work to cooperatively find the best ideas to make sure that every American has the opportunity to participate in our new digital society. With that, it really, I'm going to take my turn to um, the next speaker, who is uh, Lee Terry, who is a member of Congress from Nebraska's 2nd District. We've already mentioned one of the great stories of broadband of his district. Um, Representative Terry was first elected to the United States of House of Representatives in 1998, really kind of a turning point for broadband. Um, he received his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln in 1984. Since football season is over and I'm a Texas fan, I can really welcome you. Um, and his law degree from Creighton University Law School in 1987. Uh, Representative Terry currently serves on the House Commerce Committee, which oversees energy, health, telecommunications, trade, and consumer protection issues. Clearly a cross-section of where broadband and the power of broadband can make a real difference. Um, but better yet, for our purposes, he also serves on the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and the Internet and co-chairs the Rural Caucus Telecom Task Force. Uh, we are lucky to have such an um, affable and great advocate for broadband. He's been a leader in the promotion of broadband, the encouragement of business, small and large. Um, in the several last sessions of Congress, he's partnered with Chairman Boucher to um, reform universal service issues and has really been a strong advocate for ensuring that rural America derives the benefits of broadband services and networks. Representative Terry's work on the broadband issues highlight the goal of including all Americans in the broadband revolution, seniors, minorities, Americans with disabilities, rural Americans, and small businesses. So we are really privileged and really appreciate your joining us here this morning. So uh, we continue the theme of uh, young-faced people speaking in this part of the segment. And uh, Julius and Sean, uh, I think after a couple years, uh, you'll age gracefully. No longer will you be carded. Uh, and Julius especially, uh, since you will be issuing uh, the FCC's broadband uh, plan next week on uh, St. Patrick's Day. Good choice as an Irishman. Uh, and the fact that you uh, will include intercarrier compensation in that. Uh, Michael Copps is really 35, and he was on the commission when they first tried ICC reform, and look what happened. <laughs> so that's uh, what you've got to look forward to. Uh, but it is uh, it's great. It's what an honor uh, to be invited here. Uh, Julius, thank you, and uh, Knight Foundation. Uh, I'm glad to know that uh, the Knight Foundation is two brothers. I just thought it was the uh, named after the great anchor man Ted Knight. <laughs> so I've learned something. And uh, Meredith, thank you for that kind introduction. And we talk. Uh, we've gotten together a couple of times, and uh, we actually talk a little bit about broadband and FCC issues, but mostly Big 12 football, uh, spring. Uh, football actually starts next week, so we're pretty pumped up in Nebraska. Uh, the snow's melted. We hit 50 degrees yesterday for the first time, so our football team will don the uh, scarlet uniform and the white helmet with the red N on the side and start practicing so we can beat Texas next year. And I assure you the game will only be 60 minutes that time, not 60 minutes in one second for you sports fans out there. <laughs> Uh, but you do know what the N on our helmet stands for. Knowledge. It is a university. Now, as Meredith mentioned, I'm from uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, uh, I'm proud of my city. In fact, I, I represent more cement than dirt, but it has a nice mixture in my district. Uh, but Omaha uh, is not only the home of four Fortune 500 companies and nine Fortune 1000 companies, but it is also, as Stephen Colbert pointed out in one of my interviews with him, is the teleservices capital of the world, or the United States at least. And he mentioned or said it was because of our uh, 
non-distinct accents in Omaha. But the reality is it's because of a very robust telecommunications networks. Uh, our city has always been on the front edge of telecommunications technology. In fact, uh, in the 1980s, we were one of the first fiber-wired downtown and uh, almost complete city was wired by fiber optics. By 1992, we had multiple carriers with fiber networks servicing every building in Omaha, Nebraska. So therefore, teleservices uh, using the broad and deep teleservices infrastructure became a focal point of our economic development within the city. Now, uh, we also have STRATCOM and Offutt Air Force Base uh, that are heavy telecommunications users that also use that same network. So for the city, we have reliable, state-of-the-art equipment that ensures telecommunications transmissions run smoothly, reliably, accurately throughout the entire metropolitan area of the city. But now while Omaha, and I, I get a brag a little bit because I, some of my colleagues in the Congress tell me about their unemployment rates of you know, 15, 20 percent, even a couple that are up into the near 30s, Omaha's is 4.9 percent. We actually have a growing economy because in part, and I think mostly, we are a wired city. We can take advantages of uh, broadband and the economy that comes with it. Now, this also includes our health care systems, our education, uh, a variety of e-business internet. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many internet retail operations are headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. But the reality is that once you step out of the city of Omaha, while you will have examples like Diller, Nebraska, uh, rural America doesn't share the same broadband economic, educational, and health opportunities uh, that we have in the metropolitan area. Now, a lot of our rural telecom providers, like in Diller, Nebraska, town of less than 800 people, a uh, downtown, uh, vibrant downtown area that's probably about the length of this room, uh, but yet because of uh, vibrant broadband provider using USF dollars in part, uh, is able to offer 40 megabits to those folks. And not only do they have uh, access to all 800 of their wired customers, but they also have 1,500 uh, Wi-Fi customers uh, through a wireless system. Now, we've got plenty of other examples in rural America of the success. An entrepreneur from Bettigree, Nebraska, population 519, in northwest Nebraska, and if you guys know what Nebraska, northwest is, it uh, was once called the Great American Desert. Uh, and so uh, the, in Verdigree, a gentleman f who works for Boeing, designing computer chips, is able to use his high-capacity fiber-to-the-home network in Verdigree to video conference in real time with other Boeing employees in Seattle and around the world. Now, uh, Nebraska is also seen as a leader in the innovator for using broadband to expand educational opportunities K through 12 and throughout the state. Thanks to federal and state funds, some of which have come from the Federal Universal Service Fund in partnership with local telecommunications companies, civic and corporate dis uh, dedication, it's not uncommon to have schools being supplied with speeds up to 40 megabits per second. Uh, such uh, speeds really allow the teachers and the kids and the communities to be successful. Uh, for example, in my household in Omaha, and now because of this educational network through Nebraska, uh, many uh, children have access to their textbooks 
I don't know if any of you have kids in uh, elementary and middle school. They don't bring their books home anymore. And that's not because we don't tell them to. They're not allowed to, but they're, they can access their books uh, via the Internet and through the school's modem or the, the school's website. So they don't want the books coming home. That way they last longer, by the way. Uh, now, let's use Rushville, Nebraska, population uh, 1,100, 312 miles from Denver, 450 miles from Omaha, and 130 miles from uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. They have uh, enjoyed the educational and opportunities uh, of this system. That's who's included in here. Nebraskans have also used broadband as a new tool to re-energize and rebuild main streets. Uh, a veterinarian in Ewing, Nebraska, population 433, uses broadband to diagnose animals around the world. And now sells, and then of course the famous Diller uh, story, and if you want the name of that company, it's bluevalleymeats.com. Uh, well, I added the .com just in case you wanted to go there. But uh, now, you can certainly see why I am passionate about m ensuring that all Americans, rural, urban, uh, suburban, have access to broadband. And it's imperative that Congress and the FCC commit to a policy that will deliver broadband to all Americans. Well, stories highlight that what Nebraskans are capable if they had broadband. The reality is that in Nebraska, because of aggressive rural telecom carriers, that 90% of Nebraskans, according to a survey by a public service commission, have access to broadband. I put an asterisk next to that. That's not in the PSC's report, but it's 200 kilobits. Uh, my guess is if we went with the one up and down uh, megabits that in reality it would probably be cut in half. Uh, for schools to access textbooks, videos, uh, 200 kilobits doesn't work in today's 21st century economy. So that's why we need to continue to work on universal service using that as a platform. Working together and expand the opportunity through universal access is the theme today, and Congress and the FCC must work together to take a monumental task of reforming Universal Service Fund. That's why I'm so anxious to see, and Julius and I have met a couple times to talk about Universal Service being part of the solution. And I'm pleased that uh, next week we'll have a report and very anxious to read that. Now, on top of uh, the $50 million derived from the state USF, Nebraska is one of the few states that has their own USF fund, Nebraska received over $128 million from the Federal Universal Service Fund in 2009, and from its $9 million was used to keep public schools and libraries across Nebraska connected to the Internet, providing our kids with access to information and increased educational opportunities they otherwise wouldn't have. If USF was eliminated... A Nebraskan living in a rural area would pay an additional $235.41 on average each year to receive basic telecommunications. And I don't think it's unreasonable to say that a monthly retail rate could top $500 for a comparable broadband network if there was no mechanism for reimbursement. In the panhandle of Nebraska, I visited uh, a home where it was 30 miles out from the central station, no other houses in between, and 30 back. 60-mile loop, one house. Think of what their access would be if it weren't for USF. So the very fact is, is that USF uh, is really the heart and soul of the vibrancy of telecommunications in rural America. Now, as we move forward in reforming USF, it's important to remember that the entire telecommunications network, which includes wireless and uh, VoIP, uses the entire wireline network. They have to merge together.
The Universal Service Fund is critical in ensuring that this network remains efficient. Now, uh, many of you know me as the one with Rick Boucher trying to reform the Universal Service Fund, but not brave enough to touch intercarrier uh, compensation. We'll leave those to those of you who want your hair to gray more quickly than average. But it has to be done, and I appreciate that you've taken that task. And I look forward to working together to ensure that uh, we can ensure all Americans have access to broadband and let this be the decade of universal broadband connections. Thank you for letting me be part of your conference today. Thank you so much, Representative Ter Terry, and I would like to introduce um, Commissioner Michael Copps. Thank you. Good morning. I am the commissioner who doesn't get carded. <laughs> I am here to introduce a thought and a person. The person is greater than the thought, but I'm going to introduce the thought, or maybe actually a couple of them before the person. And you don't really have a choice about this, but thank you for your indulgence anyhow. <laughs> Two years ago, I could only dream about an event like this, bringing together journalists, thinkers, <coughs> businessmen and women, and advocates, and so many shapers of public policy to talk about making sure that every American can participate in the new digital technologies that can open more doors of opportunity than perhaps any invention in modern history. The subtitle of today's Digital Inclusion Summit, Working Together to Expand Opportunity Through Universal Broadband Access, is music to my ears. For the nine years that I have been at the FCC, I have been hoping our country would make a commitment and develop a plan for the ubiquitous deployment and universal adoption of high-speed, high-value broadband. It took a lot of time and people working hard and definitely some new government thinking to make that happen, but happening it is, thanks in a major way to the person I will shortly introduce, my friend Congressman Ed Markey. Last year, we got a charge from Congress and the President to get the job done, and next week, thanks to the vision and hard work of our Federal Communications Commission Chair, Julius Janikowski, and to the most in-depth, open, and transparent process I can ever remember happening at the FCC, such a plan will be presented to the Congress and to the American people. Broadband, as some have already remarked, is important not for technology's sake, for, but for what it can enable. This is technology that intersects with every great challenge confronting our nation, whether it's jobs, education, energy, climate change and the environment, international competitiveness, health care, equal opportunity, or overcoming disabilities. There is no solution to any of these problems that does not have a broadband component to it. So we have to work together, just as that summit title reminds us to make that happen. The going-in premise must be first and foremost that we will no longer tolerate having digital divides between the haves and have-nots, between those living in big cities and those living in rural areas or on tribal lands, between the able-bodied and persons with disabilities. Everyone must have an equal opportunity in this new digital age, no matter who they are, where they live, or the particular circumstances of their individual lives. But you know what? Even with our new government commitment, even with our forthcoming national broadband plan, even with all the enthusiasm I see gathered in this room, it is no slam dunk that we will get this job done. Let me cite just one area that illustrates the concern that I have. The country doesn't talk about it enough yet, but thanks to the Knight Commission report, I think that's beginning to change. I think many of us here would agree that there is no greater benefit that broadband can deliver than its ability to inform our civic dialogue and stimulate citizen engagement in our democracy. The future town square will be paved with broadband bricks, but how do we make that town square accessible to all? How do we ensure that it reflects the diverse voices of our diverse country? 
As the Knight Commission report so effectively points out, sustaining democracy in the digital age by effectively informing all of our communities is a core challenge for our still young 21st century. There is good news. Already we see a blossoming participatory and experimental culture on the Internet. We see evolving new platforms that astound us, from smartphones to tablets to the advent of at-home 3D viewing. We all have the fingertips. We, some of us, have the world at our fingertips. Yet even as Americans consumed 1.3 trillion hours of media in 2008, the production and distribution of essential news and information content has never been more in doubt. It will come as no surprise to many of you in this room that I have deep and abiding concerns about the state of our current media and our journalistic institutions. The same hyperspeculation and consolidation that infected so much of our economy, coupled with an almost total lack of public interest oversight of our broadcast media, decimated newsrooms, brought pink slips to many thousands of journalists, put investigative journalism on the endangered species list, and replaced too much real news with too much glitzy infotainment, and to be frank, with an often dumbed-down civic dialogue. Our country cannot afford to have the same harms that have been visited upon traditional media today to undercut the potential of new media in the digital age. Yet it may be happening. All players are not yet equal in the new digital age, all networks are not open and pulsing with the lifeblood of Internet freedom. And what happens to us on the Internet depends not just on where we choose to go, but where others might have us go. We can all go to our homes or offices and send wonderful messages into the ether. How or if these messages ever get heard, how we keep them from evaporating in the ether, is an entirely different matter. What a uh, lost opportunity it would be. What a really tragic irony of history. If this liberating new technology ended through no inherent fault of its own, by failing those who have struggled so long and hard for access to the tools of opportunity that they need to be full participants in our society. Think for a moment about just one group, our brothers and sisters who live with disabilities to realize the importance of digital inclusion and broadband openness. I have had the wonderful and totally inspiring experience of working with many disabilities communities, beginning with my very first speech as a commissioner to a deaf and hard of hearing audience in 2001. I was bowled over to see firsthand the obstacles standing in the way of what it was that they wanted. And what they wanted was no more than the opportunity to be fully productive and fully self-realized members of our society. And here were the new tools and services of the broadband era that could make it happen, make such a difference to them, so close, but yet so far away. When we have people who ask no more than the opportunity to be what they can make of themselves, when we have the tools to make it happen, and when we have this brief moment in time to combine the great engine of our private sector with a kind of visionary public policy that has always guided America's infrastructure build-outs, we dare not let that moment pass. This is our responsibility. It is not something that would be nice for us to do. It is these people's right, and I think it is a civil right to have this kind of access because access denied is opportunity denied. I could deliver an entire speech on this subject, but there is someone here who can do a lot better job than me. A legislator, a leader, a visionary, an achiever, an overachiever, who has fought for people with disabilities, fought for inclusion, fought for access, and really fought for us all. Since he came to Congress, elected in 1976, the statesman, and I think that's the right term, statesman, has pointed America toward the North Star of opportunity for all. A list of his accomplishments would take up the morning session, so let me just mention a few in the area of communications, not even getting into his monumental accomplishments in health care, energy, and the environment. First, there would be no broadband plan without him. 
It was Congressman Ed Markey who added the amendment to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that required the FCC to develop the National Broadband Plan. Congressman Markey was the primary House, House author of the evade provision of the 1996 Telecom Act, providing funding to schools and libraries for access to advanced communication service. I think he even coined the term E-rate. And what a success, what a success that program has been. And he has recently introduced the E-rate 2.0 Act to strengthen and expand this important program. He was responsible for the successful passage of the 1990 law that required closed captioning for all TVs. And in the current Congress, he has introduced the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, H.R. 3101, I think, to help ensure that as technology changes, our nation's commitment to ensuring access for all keeps pace. That's just a sampling, and the list goes on, but you get the picture. Plus, most of you know him very, very well. Ed Markey is effective, eloquent, and passionate about issues that I care about, you care about, and that all America should care about. I know he is your friend, and I'm proud, truly proud, to call him mine. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my most favorite people in Washington, or anywhere else for that matter, <laughs> Congressman Ed Markey. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Michael Copps, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, Commissioner Copps and I have a mutual admiration society. He has been a stalwart champion of the public interest and for upholding the values that the Communications Act charges the Commission with fulfilling on behalf of the American people. Diversity, localism, universal service, competition, and innovation. Commissioner Copps assesses each decision he confronts with those values as his guide stars and seeks to maximize uh, those values for the public. So it is my honor to have been introduced by you, uh, Commissioner Copps, uh, and to be here with you, um, Chairman Janikowski, uh, with uh, Commissioner uh, Baker, uh, with uh, Alberto uh, Ibaguan. Uh, thank you for hosting this incredible event. Uh, back in the 1990s, uh, when uh, I was able to move 200 megahertz of spectrum over uh, for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, cell phone license, uh, and uh, as a result was able to drop the price to under 10 cents a minute from 50 cents a minute, uh, and people wouldn't have to carry around a brick. Uh, uh, they could just have something that they could slip into their hands uh, and, and a revolution was created, a revolution which actually makes it possible right now for at least 10 to 20 percent of this uh, audience, as I am speaking, uh, to actually be checking their BlackBerry, okay? And, <laughs> and that's, I, I consider that to be an honor. That's a, it's an honor. And I, I think any speaker who uh, is disturbed by that just doesn't understand what this revolution has made possible. And, uh, and we have to ensure going forward that we expand that revolution so that every American, no matter who they are or where they live, uh, has access to this revolution. The provision requiring a national broadband plan that I successfully added to the Recovery Act was designed to do three things. The provision first, uh, was constructed in a way uh, so that we did not receive just another agency report. I wanted a real plan, one that was both pragmatic and aspirational. Second, I wanted the FCC to deal with broadband well, broadly. A broad view is needed to factor in how this indispensable infrastructure of the future could be put to the task of tackling a range of national challenges and priorities from health care to education to energy efficiency. And third, the plan needed to ensure that affordable, 
high-speed internet access reached all Americans and that we increased our subscribership levels across the board. So how could we approach this national broadband plan? Over 40 years ago, Robert Kennedy spoke to how we measure the wealth of a community and the difficulty in quantifying intangible assets or values. He said, we cannot measure national spirit by the Dow Jones average, nor national achievement by the gross national product. For the gross national product does not allow for the health of our families, the quality of their education, the joy of their play. The gross national product measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except whether we are proud to be Americans. Now, let me tell you, we could have had a national broadband plan merely quantifying the speeds of our telecommunications networks and the number of miles of fiber and cable wires. We could have simply tallied up the profit margins and market caps of phone companies, cable companies, high-tech titans, and content producers. We could have had a report that measured only megabits and megahertz. In the final analysis, we could have settled for a plan that told people everything about the state and quality of our broadband networks, except those things that make use of such networks worthwhile. Things like, do these broadband networks broaden digital divides or democratize access to unlimited opportunity? Do they prepare kids with the skills that they will need for their future? Do they strengthen our democracy? Do these networks help us tackle national challenges like health care, <coughs> educational opportunity, energy efficiency, public safety, creating jobs, sparking entrepreneurial activity and investment, guaranteeing access for the disability community? That is why I am so pleased to be here today. Because today we're talking about a plan that is not merely for megabits and megahertz, but for consumers and communities. It is a plan, not just a report, not just a summary, but a roadmap to our broadband future. And this plan will point the way towards a smarter electricity grid and help unleash the power of e-chips and the internet to enable consumers to make smarter decisions about their energy usage. And with this plan, we need to bring all Americans with us, seniors, minorities, rural, urban, Americans with disabilities, ensuring that everyone is connected. In the decades ahead, America needs to compete in a fiercely competitive economy with all of the diversity and productivity and innovation that our people can muster to the task. If we don't prepare all of our citizens for the future, we will suffer the consequences. In the year 2025, census projections indicate that the majority of Americans will be members of minority groups. In addition, we have tens of millions of citizens who are deaf or hard of hearing, sight impaired or blind. And as our population ages, we will inevitably have more citizens who may be hard of hearing or sight impaired. I have long believed that telecommunications technologies can empower and ennoble the lives of our citizens and propel our country to even greater heights of prosperity and progress for all of our people. To achieve this goal, we must ensure that all Americans can access and utilize the telecommunications tools such as broadband that are indispensable for success in the global economy. I have no doubt that we can do it as we have answered great challenges throughout our history. 
We've done this before with dramatic results. The E-rate, or education rate program, created as part of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, is a good example of how government brought organization, determination, and focus to solve an internet access problem, benefiting millions of Americans from all different backgrounds, income levels, and regions of our country. I was proud to be the lead author in the House creating the E-rate program in 1996. Before the E-rate program, few schools, all libraries, were connected to the internet. At the time, only 14 percent of K through 12 classrooms had internet access. Today, more than 95 percent do, putting our country at the head of the class when it comes to connecting schools and libraries to the internet. What does that tell us? It's very simple. When America has a plan, America can lead the world. Now with the National Broadband Plan, we are going to continue to connect America from the small towns to the big cities, this time with affordable, high-speed uh, uh, internet service. The plan signals our country's aim to connect all of our citizens to the benefits and potential of the future, and in the process, set our entire nation on a course for even greater prosperity and success in the years to come. I know that this plan is due on March 17th. For many of us, especially those like me with Irish heritage, March 17th has always been a particularly lucky day. Colin Crowell and I agree on that. Now with the launch of the plan on March 17th, it will be a lucky day not just for the Irish, but for the entire country. And if we're really lucky, we'll get the plan a day earlier, so we can start a day earlier. It is great uh, to be here with you. This is an historic uh, moment in time. It is the broadband plan for everyone that has been desperately needed for our country. As we slip from second down to 15th or 16th, in deployment and speed and access, it was because we did not have a plan. This will not only be a plan to ensure that everyone has access to it, but we will be animating it with the values uh, that we believe it should have uh, so that our country is number one looking over its shoulders at number two and three in the world in the years ahead. Thank you all so much for all of the work that we're doing on this panel. Thank you very much, Representative Markey. I also wanted to point out something else that's on your packet and in your website, and that is a, uh, a flyer for another event we're having tomorrow that specifically talks about uh, broadband and accessibility for people with disabilities. That's uh, another opportunity to learn more details of the National Broadband Plan. I also wanted to ask people who are standing over there in the corner, you are welcome to come over. Come on up. Feel free to take seats over here and be comfortable. Many of you know that I'm kind of new at the FCC, and I'm a little bit starstruck by an agenda that includes Secretary Donovan, Chairman Janikowski, Commissioners Copps and Claiborne and Baker, um, Alberto Ibarguen, as well as Representatives Markey and Terry. But I'm equally impressed with our next flight of speakers. The Voices of Inclusion speakers are here to remind us how imperative it is that we're all included in this digital revolution. Rhonda Locklear has just recently been able to afford a broadband connection at her home, and she knows the benefits of broadband from her work environment and is using that connection and her experience as a champion of broadband to drive both her, her economy, family, and family, her economy, her community, and her family's education in rural North Carolina. Garrison Phillips started blogging in his 70s. He uses his internet connection for a number of things, including internet research, to support health information, both for himself and his 103-year-old mother, who couldn't be here today, but we do have Garrison. 
Florence Pearson is a person who perhaps is most known for love. She's the mother of four and also the adoptive mother of an additional four children. She works at a Head Start program where she influences even more children. She did this all without a computer connection for a number of reasons, one being fear. Until only a week or two ago, she took a program that has helped to change her life and to maintain more connections for herself and her family. Alex Kurt is a volunteer with AmeriCorps who works at the Rondo Library in St. Paul, where he's developed digital skills training and is working with a number of populations, including non-English speakers, to teach them about the Internet. And many of them are using those skills to open up job opportunities for themselves and their communities. Arvind Avias is like many of us who found um, a career change needed at midlife. <laughs> He, went, he heard about a new computer training program that was offered at a local organization, and he went back to get his computer technician training. He earned A-plus certification, as now has joined the ranks of the employed at Time Warner, a member of Local 3. For those of us who are jaded, well-ingrained broadband users, maybe we forget what this meant to us at the beginning what it meant when we were just included in this new world of connections and communications. These five speakers um, are here to help us remember. Rhonda, would you come and start? Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share my story with you. My name is Rhonda Locklear. I'm from Pembroke, and I'm a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. I have two children, and like any mother, I want the best for my boys. Jacob, my oldest, is a transferring student to UNC Pembroke, and Isaac is in the eighth grade at Pembroke Middle School. Like most families across the state who either don't have access to high-speed internet who, or who can't afford it. We were stuck with dial-up service in our home until two months ago. I feel that this has put my family, my sons in particular, at a severe disadvantage. Isaac depends on the internet to complete his assignments for school. He often uses the internet to work on reports, projects, or often at times to just do research. I watched him struggle with the dial-up service and observed him get frustrated because he could not move around on the web like he likes and needed to do. Seemingly easy assignments took him hours to complete. It's very disheartening to watch. Isaac got very upset, discouraged, and frustrated because he could not do what he needed to do. As a mother, it breaks my heart and causes me to feel that I have failed him in some way. In Robinson County, where I live, the economic situation is dire for our community and for the Lumbee tribe. The textile industry has disappeared, and so have the jobs. And without high-speed internet, we don't stand a chance of reviving our economy. And without high-speed internet, my son's chances of a better future are at risk. The world has become so dependent on technology and the internet that if our children don't get what they need, they're going to be left behind. I envision a future for myself, my boys, and the Lumbee community where we can fully participate in the 21st century through, through, light, through the internet. It is my hope that the National Broadband Plan can alleviate these struggles and give my community and communities across the country access to fast, affordable, open internet. 
our future as a tribe and as a country depends on it. Thank you for coming together today to talk about the digital divide. Thank you very much, Rhonda. I'd like to introduce Garrison Phillips. Good morning, everyone. My name is Garrison Phillips. I'm 80 years old, retiree, and I don't get carded much anymore. <laughs> I'm a Korean War veteran. I'm a graduate of West Virginia University. And I'm a longtime volunteer with Sage and Oates in the greater New York senior community. I'm delighted to be here to be in this extraordinary company particularly at my age, to let you know just a bit what broadband has done for me. When I first retired, I, I bought a brand new computer and a printer, and I had time to write again, which is my life. I love it. And I was lost. I couldn't maneuver the internet. But fortunately, I discovered OATS, Older Adults Technology Services, which teaches the internet free to seniors at YMCA's and senior centers throughout New York City. Fortunately, I did this because I drive once a month to spend a week in the care of my 103-year-old mother. But in between times, because of broadband, I am in touch with her major caregiver, her doctor if need be, and members of her church who email me that they have spoken with or seen my mother that day, and she's doing just fine. And she is. Right now, she's watching the TV and March Madness and cheering on the West Virginia Mountaineers. <laughs> in New York City, I live in a fifth, sixth floor walk-up apartment. I no longer have to scramble down six flights and literally crawl back up again to do research for my blog and my short stories. It's all right at my fingertips with broadband. And I'm able to stay in contact with classmates from high school and college and the Army with not only New York City, but across the entire country. I spent 50-some years as an actor, but I, I had to retire because I have extreme hearing loss. I may be shouting. I can't tell right now. But once in a while, I get a chance for an audition for a TV commercial for old people. My agent doesn't telephone me because I can't hear him. He sends me an email with the information. And incidentally, Wall Street is discovering that seniors like me invest in a lot more than canes and motorized scooters. <laughs> just, just to tell you how, how strong I am, how independent, what a better position I am psychologically now than when I retired 14 years ago is amazing. Just one last quick thought. My earliest memory from probably two and a half to three years old is riding in a horse-drawn farm wagon with my great uncle Arthur from a farm on Eisner Creek into Elkins, West Virginia, a three-mile ride. I would happily make that wagon ride again today, but this time I would have my computer with me. We have come such an astonishing distance in my lifetime. All I can say is, well, let's keep going. Let's make access to broadband available to cross the country for everyone, to let other folks be helped the way I have been helped. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Garrison Phillips. And um, Florence Pearson is also joined by her daughter, Iquana. And I think you're both going to come up, aren't you? Come on up. Good 
Good morning, everybody. My name is Florence Pearson, and I live in New York City with my three grandchildren and my three children. One who is with me today, Iquana. She will speak to you briefly how exciting she is about having a computer in our home today. I am also an education director at the James Weldon Johnson Head Start program. I'm here to tell you what a difference the computer training I had with Prescolas this past Saturday has made my life change. Prior to the training, I was afraid of computers. I thought if I do something wrong, if I ever got on one and I didn't understand the importance of the computer in my life, that I would break it. I knew how important it was for my school-aged children and grandchildren, how important the computer was for them, and that's why I was motivated to attend this training. While I would go to the library with Iquana, I would only watch her as she did her homework. I was handicapped because I had to get someone to type my work for me, and still do today. And I will admit, I was embarrassed not knowing anything at all about computers and not having an email address. I knew I was missing out on so much, but I could not get over this fear. My fear, as I said earlier, was breaking the computer, not understanding how to use it. Even where I lived, they offered a computer class, but my, pay, my fear prevented me from attending any of the classes there. Now, I cannot wait for the next series of classes. <laughs> what brought about the change was Equana. Equana asked me to enroll in Prescola's Comp 2 Kids program through her school. She wanted us to have a computer in our home, which would get, we would get at the end of our training. I backed out on the first class because I was afraid. Finally, I said, let me try this. Even when we got to the class and I saw all those computers, I had Iquana going first. <laughs> when the class began and the instructor asked, the instructor started with the basics and explained things in simple terms, my fears vanished. While I did understand, while I did not understand everything, I did understand that with a little help and time, I could be able to use the computer without the fear. It was like an entirely new world for me. Yes, I saw that the possibilities of doing work, my work, more efficiently and being able to communicate with the teachers that I interact with. I saw that I could shop and pay bills and find out what colleges would be good for Equana and the other children in my home. I saw how we could look for movies and times and check to see what books were available in the library, and I no longer would have to go with her. I saw how my children and grandchildren could do their homework and school assignments and the safety of our home. It is impossible for me to relate in these few minutes how much my life has changed, and it has greatly been taken, it has been greatly taken by this class. All I can see now are possibilities for myself and for my family. My daughter, Iquana, will say a few words. Iquana will say how, a few words. But I just wanted to say that that class that I took was one of the best classes in the world. I went in with fear, and I came out with the motivation to now I'm going to tackle the computer and try my best not to have others do my work. I'm going to try to do it myself and to make my children proud. I'm happy that we got the computer because in my school they're getting us ready for college and we have to type everything up and now that I got my own computer I don't have to worry about anybody rushing me to get off the computer and I could do my own internet I got a flash drive now that y'all gave me and I could do everything on my own and I'm really happy thank you you're awesome nice job
Thank you very much, Aquana and Florence. And I would like to now introduce Alex Kurt with the AmeriCorps program in St. Paul. Thank you. Um, my name is Alex Kurt. I'm an AmeriCorps member uh, serving with the Community Technology Empowerment Project, or uh, CTEP, in the Twin Cities. Um, I'm one of 30 members, uh, all of whom are working to close the gap in technology literacy, what CTEP calls the digital divide. Uh, that has emerged as uh, technology has become more standardized, but those without access to it have fallen further behind. Specifically, I teach and coordinate computer skills classes at St. Paul's Rondo Library. Uh, most of the students come from the surrounding neighborhood, which just blocks from the state capitol building, has some of Minnesota's highest rates of unemployment and poverty. It's pretty standard to have 15 or 16 students uh, in a class meant for 12, uh, all adults over 40 of whom maybe fewer than half have ever used a computer in their life. Uh, they're often overwhelmed and intimidated by the machines, afraid that they might uh, break it if they type the wrong key, they're unsure of how to handle the mouse, uh, and so on. Most of them don't have any trouble coming to the class at 10.30 in the morning because most of them don't have jobs and hope that this is the first step in fixing that. Now there's some good news, and that's that by and large, uh, my work has shown some tangible results. Students are emailing each other by the end of the first class. Uh, they're typically moving on to more advanced instruction and in Excel and Word. More recently, we've begun to partner with the Minnesota Literacy Council to reach English language learners, and we're currently working on implementing a library-wide certification program that would provide more tangible benefits to students who take multiple classes. The problem with that is that the success of our programming has only highlighted how big the problem really is. Um, for every student who finishes the first class and moves on, it seems that two or three more will call and say, I've lost my job. I don't know how to use computers. How can you help me? Uh, for all the people with whom I work, I know there are many more who I'll never meet and never have the chance to help. So it's true my individual service has been successful, but only as far as it can reach. And to be frank, that's not far enough to keep up with the problem as it grows. An organization like CTEP simply isn't big enough to tackle this problem at its roots. What we're doing right now is damage control. Moreover, even if there were 100 members in CTEP teaching 1,200 people a day, it wouldn't mean a lot if those students don't have a computer or internet access once they leave the class. The point is that I, like, um, everyone else in the front row can attest to the reason that we're here. We know that a staggeringly vulnerable part of our population is made more so by a gap in technology literacy. We know that those who most need computer skills or internet access to meet their basic needs are also those who are least likely to have either. So I won't dwell on it except to say, if only for the sake of the people at the library, that I hope we can do more and do it soon. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alex. And our uh, final voice of inclusion speaker is Erwin Avias. There he is. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the Knight Foundation for the opportunity for speaking here today. Um, about what broadband means to me, and I'm adding, if it's okay with you, Julius, and what, and what the FCC also means to me. I would also like to thank the FCC, Perscolis, Time Warner, Local 3, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. My name is Irvin Aviles. I worked for Time Warner Cable, Local 3, like I said, for seven years. My position is I'm a, I'm a cable technician, I'm a journeyman, or a journey person, I should correct that, a level, level five technician. It's one of the highest levels. It means you have, ex you have some experience. You're a, junior, uh, a senior tech. Um, I'm a resident of the Bronx all my life. I'm 54 years old. I get carded. <laughs> Thanks, Julius. Uh, I'm married 32 years and would like to thank my wife and my mother for being here. I mean, I wouldn't be here without them. Um, my wife works for the Board of Education. She is, she's worked for the Board of Education for 30 years, 20 years as a school teacher in East Harlem, and 10 years as a principal in East Harlem. She loves her job, 
and she's definitely not in it for the money. She really loves the job. It's hard work. I have four children. Approximately one month ago, I got the privilege and the honor uh, to answer the question to Julius. What does broadband mean to me? To the FCC chairman, uh, Julius Janikowski. And again, I'm adding the FCC to that. So today, with your permission, I'd like to add that. So the question is, what does broadband and the FCC mean to me? It means broad opportunities for a common community. Again, I'm going to say it again. It means broad opportunities for a common community. Why? Because seven years ago, at the age of 47, I was laid off after working for, for a major corporation for 15 years. I really didn't know what I was going to do. My future was not clear. I was very scared. I actually worked on teletypes back then. That's how old I am. I had no PC experience. I knew the H plate adjustment for those texts who uh, know that. Um, and I needed a little hope. Around that time, broadband was creating the opportunity. Seven years ago, eight years ago, it was high-speed internet access. Thank God that Time Warner, Local 3, and Prescolis were working together to meet the needs of our customers and in the process help somebody like me. I would also like to thank, thank the founder of Prescolis, Mr. John Stuckey who had the vision to see someone like me benefiting from the opportunities that broadband and other technologies created. Prescolis is a, not, is a not for profit in the South Bronx that offers free PC training, free job placement, A plus certification, as well as other certifications. Like I've got my Network Plus, which just says, you know, A plus is just fundamental knowledge of PCs. Network Plus is just fundamental knowledge of, 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 piece, of networks. Um, and I've said this before, and Mrs. McFarlane, you, can, you know this, you know what I'm going to say. They recycle PCs as well as people. They kind of dusted me off, put a new board in, put a little bit more software, <laughs> showed me how to do a presentation, <laughs> you know, update my resume, you know. That, you know. <laughs> um, so um, it, it, took, it, took some, it, uh, it took someone like me who was 47 years old with no PC experience, scared of technology, I was afraid also, and, and, um, and not been to school for 30 years. I mean, that's a long time. I was really afraid of taking exams. I really, really was. Thank God for Sister Maureen in Prescolis. She quizzed us every day, every day, 10 questions. Um, don't wor and, and, and what they told me, Prescolis, was don't worry, we have a proven plan of success. E everything is going to be okay. Let us tell you the Time Warner plan to become a journey person. This gave me hope for a second chance. And Time Warner Cable, Local 3, gave me the second chance by hiring me. And hiring 140, if I'm not mistaken, 140 students since then. It's a great company to work for and a great union to work for because they care about people. So what does broadband mean to me? It means broad opportunities for the common community, giving somebody like me hope and a second chance. So I say now is the time, and if I could extend this out to Alberto Ibargue also. Now is the time. Let us all seize the opportunity. Again, thank, thank every, I would like to thank everybody, especially God, for this opportunity. Okay, so you saw me scurrying around, and it was because we have earned a break. So we're going to adjust our schedule just briefly, and um, I invite you to take a 15-minute break. Some of the organizations and more that you heard about are available in the break room. We'll meet you back here online in, and in this room in 15 minutes at exactly 11 o'clock, and um, we'll still have time for Q&A. We look forward to seeing you in 15 minutes back here. Thank you.
Okay. I want to welcome everyone back. Um, we've had a, a, a great morning and we're going to continue. Um, I want to obviously welcome uh, the museum guests that are, are seated here, but we are lucky uh, in our digital age to also be welcoming a number of communities from across the country. Um, particularly grateful uh, for the Knight Foundation to be joining us uh, in sponsored sites in Akron, Detroit, Miami, Philadelphia, and Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, you can also, uh, many of you, as many of you know, be uh, virtually attending via the website on FCC.gov slash live. So we uh, welcome those guests as well. Um, as you know, the Knight Foundation works toward informed, engaged communities, so we strongly encourage you to continue to be engaged uh, in this process now and in the future. Uh, you can Twitter the, in the conversation at uh, hashtag uh, BB, uh, that's for broadband plan, as Karen mentioned earlier, broadband plan. Uh, we also welcome you at the Knight Foundation to uh, join us at knightfoundationblog.org or just um, knightfoundation.org. Uh, and you'll find a lot of uh, inter interesting information about what we're up to at the Knight Foundation. Questions can be directed to the, Knight, to the museum via tweet or email, newmedia at fcc.gov or uh, we have uh, cards here. Uh, I believe there were some in your packet, and we have extra cards if you can't find them in your packet. Um, uh, just a reminder that bios are in your packet, so the introductions for the speakers are going to be very brief. Uh, and we uh, just remind you that if you'd like to know more information about the speakers, please do feel free to look at those bios in your packet. Um, remember to take some time uh, during the break to visit the inclusion. Uh, uh, sections. It's very interesting uh, work, and I thought we had an extraordinary session this morning uh, in getting some examples from the folks uh, on inclusion uh, in some of those demonstration cases. If you're going to watch online, please go to broadband.gov.blog, click to see the descriptions in the programs, and visit them online. Uh, I want to introduce one of our commissioners. Uh, we're very fortunate to have her with us this morning. Cl uh, Commissioner Clyburn, please join us. Thank you. Good morning. I'm a little bit uh, more vertically challenged in Alberta, so I had to make an adjustment uh, here. I think you'll forgive me. Uh, thank you, uh, Alberto, and uh, to your wonderful team. It is fitting that the FCC, under the able leadership of Chairman Janikowski, partnered with the Knight Foundation to organize America's Digital Inclusion Summit. For decades, the Knight Foundation has worked at the local level to develop informed and engaged communities. So it is no surprise that the Foundation joined the FCC today in this conversation about broadband adoption. Growing broadband adoption is essential to ensuring that all Americans can be informed and can participate in our democracy. This undertaking requires a group effort of the most ambitious kind, federal, state, and local governments, private companies and nonprofits, as well as neighbors, friends, and family members. I'll go, Ms. Locklear, Ms. Aviles, and Ms. Pearson, and cute little Iquana, is to not fail you. I have made no secret of my interest in broadband adoption since my first days on the Federal Communications Commission. To that end, I've met periodically with the broadband's adoption and use team to discuss the direction of their work. I've been impressed with the commitment and hard work of these dedicated public servants. They've met with many interested parties, including some of you today, and considered, debated, just a bit, and refined countless numbers of ideas. I salute them for the contribution to the plan, especially under such tight deadlines. Broadband is one of our generation's most important challenges, primarily because it prevents, presents one of our most monumental opportunities. Universal broadband and the skills to use it can lower barriers of means and distance, 
can help achieve a more equal opportunity for all Americans. It can provide the same level of education to a young student in Mountain Air, New Mexico, as one in Northwest Washington, D.C. It can bring quality health care to men and women in extremely rural areas like South Carolina without them having to drive several hours for a routine but essential screening. It can allow men and women with disabilities to live more independently wherever they choose. They could telecommute and run businesses from their homes or receive rehabilitation, a rehabilitation therapy in remote and rural areas. But the potential for broadband to be an equalizing force will not be realized if we fail to act. Rather than closing the opportunity gap, absent action, the individual and societal cost of digital exclusion will only multiply. Want to find a job? More and more companies are listing jobs exclusively online. If you don't have internet access, these opportunities will pass you by. Want to start a business? Today, competitive small businesses can grow by using world-class IT systems in the cloud and reaching a global market, but not if they don't have broadband. Want your children to have a quality education? The internet can open the door to information sources around the world. Parents can communicate more directly with teachers and school officials to stay involved and shape their children's education. But these opportunities will not be re realized if some students and parents have internet access at home and others do not. As political dialogue moves to online forums, as the internet becomes a comprehensive source of real-time news and information, and as the easiest access to our government becomes email or website, then those who are offline become increasingly disenfranchised. Until recently, not having broadband was simply an inconvenience. Today, now it's becoming essential an essential opportunity even to citizenship. As I've said before, if the adoption gap is not addressed soon, today's digital divide will soon transform into a digital canyon. Altogether, 93 million Americans do not have broadband at home. And adoption rates are much lower among certain populations, including rural Americans at 50%, the elderly at 65%, persons with disabilities at 42%, low-income Americans at 40%, African Americans at 59%, and Hispanics at 49%. Among the 13 million children between the ages of 5 and 17 who do not have broadband at home, 6 million are either Hispanic or African American. These disparities will, won't just disappear over time if we just sit back and do nothing. Achieving our goals will require an understanding of why individuals choose not to adopt. I often call this inquiry the last half mile. You see, we often talk about the broadband challenge as finding the way to the last half mile of infrastructure. In the past, many people assumed that once the physical pipes were laid, our job was complete. We now know, however, that bringing broadband to people's home is only half the challenge. The other half, the other half mile, so to speak, is understanding exactly why particular non-adopting consumers have chosen to take that path. There is no one-size-fits-all solution here. It is a community-by-community community proposition, and we have to be willing to work locally to get this job done. One step in the right direction was a rigorous and ambitious consumer adoption study undertaken by the FCC's broadband team, particularly Dr. John Horrigan. This research identified three key obstacles to adoption. The first is affordability. The number one reason people cite for being offline is cost. Some might be in the position of having to choose between paying for basic necessities or paying for broadband, while others might not see the value of broadband relative to other things they could pay for, say like cable TV. The second is digital literacy. 
Many Americans lack the basic understanding of how to locate trustworthy content, how to protect personal information, and how to safely interact online. The third is relevance. Many Americans don't understand the potential benefits that broadband offers for them. In reality, the majority of non-adopters face multiple barriers. For example, a person, for example, a person may not believe broadband to be relevant to his life, and therefore he may never develop the digital skills to use the technology. Or another person may not have sufficient funds to subscribe to a broadband service, but may also be wary of what may happen to her if she goes online. Any way we look at it, for approximately one-third of American households, we have a substantial broadband adoption challenge ahead of us. So how do we tackle this challenge? Based on survey researches about barriers, online behaviors, and non-adopters' attitudes, as well as the Commission's other research to date, the National Broadband Plan will offer recommendations around three core principles. So the solutions should be targeted, collaborative, and local. Targeted solutions should aim to direct resources at populations less likely to be online with broadband. Collaborative solutions acknowledge the need for government leadership and coordination in this area, but also it relies on private, nonprofit, and philanthropic sectors. And local solutions understand that while the decision to adopt is an individual one, the path to adoption is social. It unfolds in homes, libraries, schools and community organizations in neighborhoods across the country. Local solutions give people an opportunity to learn an unfamiliar technology in the right environment and with the right content, technology, and teachers that can bring it all together for them. This is what Dr. Nicole Turner Lee from the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies appropriately terms creating a culture of use. The staff has come up with a number of recommendations with these goals in mind. To help with costs, the plan recommends expanding low-income universal service support to broadband and exploring using Spectrum for a free or very low-cost wireless service. Partnerships between public, private, nonprofit, and philanthropic sectors can help address the relevance barrier by encouraging comprehensive solutions that combine hardware, service, training, and content, and by conducting outreach and awareness campaigns that target underserved communities. Continuing federal support for state and local broadband initiatives is also essential. The plan also highlights a need for renewed emphasis on program evaluation and measurement and a national best practices clearinghouse. Despite over 15 years of efforts focused on bridging the, bridging the digital divide, data of what works is scarce. We can, take all, we can all take the advantage of the current momentum in this area to learn from our investments and from each other to inform future policy and programmatic decisions. There is one recommendation in particular that I would like to highlight today if you allow me to because I think it has tremendous, tremendous potential. Next week's plan will recommend a three-part national digital literacy program designed to give all Americans the skill they, skills they need to stay and get online. The program will consist of the National Digital Literacy Corps, a one-time investment to bolster the capacity of libraries and community centers and online skills portals for free basic skills training. The central feature in this program, the proposed National, national Digital Literacy Corps, is similar to programs like AmeriCorps and Senior Corps. The Digital Literacy Corps will mobilize hundreds of digital ambassadors in local communities across this country. This is about neighbors helping neighbors get online. The Corps can target vulnerable communities with below average adoption rates like low-income housing developments, rural towns, 
tribal lands and areas populated primarily by racial and ethnic minorities. Our country has long recognized the power of education and information, particularly for those who face other disadvantages. Frederick Douglass once said, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Nothing can open more doors for a person than literacy. But knowing how to read is no longer sufficient to be literate in the 21st century. Basic literacy, my friends, must be supplemented with digital liter literacy. The Commission has already ex has experience in a related program that gives us confidence in our ability to see that this succeeds. In the waning months of the DTV transition, the FCC enlisted the help of AmeriCorps to go out into communities across this country to help consumers hook up their converter boxes in order to ensure that they would continue to receive free, over-the-air television during the transition. Young men and women fanned across this nation, from right here in Washington, D.C., to New Orleans, Denver, and Los Angeles. They were welcomed in people's homes and helped them get ready for the transition and beyond. That same spirit can be applied to the longer-term goal of helping our nation's citizens gain the necessary digital literacy skills to participate fully in what broadband has to offer, using people from within the community to help their neighbors can go a long way in ensuring that people are able to use the internet safely and to its fullest potential. Some non-adopters, particularly older Americans and those who are not touched by technology in their communities, may be uncomfortable operating a computer or might be worried about being exposed online to dangers. Helping those people understand the basics, the basics about, about computers and the internet may be enough, may be just enough to get them online. A recent study commissioned by the Social Science Research Council highlighted the roles of communities in supporting digital literacy. Non-adopters and new users, especially those in low-income and minority communities, often rely on the assistance of others, the assistance of others, to get online or provide one-on-one -on -one support. This fact is also why we need to recognize the need for continuing investment in public access points like libraries, community-based organizations, and others. We have talented young people, talented young people graduating from college committed to doing volunteer work in their communities who, might, who may be unable right now to find a job. And we have workers laid off mid-career, searching for employment opportunities that require a new set of skills. The core, this core can put these people to work building our nation's digital skills and building upon its history of grassroots action and community service. Then our country and all of its people will be prepared to compete in the 21st century global economy. It can help ensure that online community is an inclusive one. The principle of inclusion is part of the foundation of our democracy. It is embedded in the statute that created the FCC, and it must be at the heart of our national broadband plan. Together, together we can work to ensure that the rich promise of our technological future reaches all Americans, and that all Americans can take advantage of all that broadband has to offer. This is our aim, and this is our responsibility. I thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. And I do want to um, reintroduce, because I didn't do it before, uh, Damian Thorman. Uh, he is the tall one uh, at the Knight Foundation. And he's going to introduce Ted Olson. Ted Olson. I just want to briefly introduce, uh, introduce Mr. Olson. Uh, for many of you, you uh, he needs no introduction, but I want to briefly uh, mention his uh, esteemed career. Um, he, as uh, many of you know, he's the former Solicitor General of the United States, former U.S. Attorney, Counselor to uh, US, two U.S. Presidents, 
Uh, he's argued 56 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, including, of course, uh, Gore v. Bush. And uh, as uh, many of you know, uh, he is the co-chair of the Knight Commission on Information Needs of a Community and a Democracy, which he's here today to talk to us about. Uh, each of you received a copy of this in your packet. It is also on your uh, USB drive and, of course, available at the Knight Foundation site. Uh, Mr. Olson, please join us. Thank you. I probably would have been better received had you not mentioned one of those cases in this. <laughs> The Knight Commission um, was uh, created uh, by the Knight Foundation and the Aspen Institute in 2008 to examine in this rapidly changing communications world the information needs of citizens in a democracy. Our 17-person commission included the, uh, two former FCC chair, publishers, editors, and executives of prominent broadcasters and the print media leading experts in technology and the internet, including our co-chair, Marissa Meyer, Google's vice president of search, community organizers, the president of the NAACP, the director of the National Public Nashville Public Library, and the president of the Knight, Knight Commission and the Aspen Institute. For a year and a half, we conducted hearings, took testimony from scores of experts and citizens, conducted studies, and held meetings throughout the United States. We focused on geographical communities as the focus of political decisions and community life in this country. We examined what information citizens in these communities needed to, to participate fully in governance and to achieve economic health for themselves and for their neighbors. In the process, we created or we talked about the concept of healthy, informed communities. Our goals were to recommend ways to maximize the ability of creditable, current, and usable information to enhance the capacity of individuals and citizens to use that information and to promote civic engagement of citizens in the maximum utilization of that information to better improve their lives and improve the governance of their communities. Citizens in informed communities need information to learn about their environment, their economy, themselves, and their government, to coordinate with one another, to solve problems, to establish public accountability, and to bond with one another the popular word we heard over and over again was connectedness, over and over again. Information is as vital as clean air, good schools, safe streets, and public health in our community. It is not a luxury or a convenience. Information is a necessity. Our conclusions, which you'll see in the report, focused on access to the Internet, the ability to use it, a government committed to transparency, quality journalism through print, television, radio, and high-speed online sources of information, and high-tech libraries. We cannot thrive as a nation or in our individual communities with second-class communication citizens and second-class information communities. That is not tolerable in this nation. Specifically, the Knight Commission urged ambitious standards for nationwide broadband availability and public policies encouraging consumer demand for capacity and use of broadband services and other media uh, support efforts uh, for of information providers to reach local audiences with quality content through all appropriate media, including television, print, mobile phones, radio, cables, uh, and new platforms. 
innovation and experimentation we found again and again produces more innovation and exploitation and more innovation again. This leads to more opportunities for people, more information for people, more participation for people, and more accountability in our government. Information is as vital as air and water to democratic communities. Citizens must have it uh, in order to function, to be free, and to thrive. That information must be current, immediate, usable, and transmittable. It must be affordable and relatively equally available to all. On behalf of the Knight Commission, uh, of, on the information needs of communities in a democracy, we are grateful to Chairman Janikowski um, and to members of the FCC for this initiative, which is exciting, extremely exciting, hence so, so many participants here, uh, to achieve these goals that we talked about, and to the Knight Foundation for this conference to promote attention on these important civic objectives. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate in this conference. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. Um, it gives me pleasure. Um, as you know, today's event is focused on broadband adoption. But our national broadband plan has at least two other major areas in the program. One is infrastructure, and the other one is national purposes, where national purposes talk about leveraging broadband to drive um, national values like education, economic development, health care, civic engagement, and public safety. City Parish President Joey Durrell has championed a program that really cuts across all three areas and does so in a very um, uh, uh, ambitious way. The Fiber to the Home Project in Lafayette, Louisiana, um, has driven economic development as well as education. And the home access capabilities are allowing people to get on the broadband, broadband, get onto broadband from their home in ways like I do, as well as doing search on their TVs. Um, he was uh, 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 announced as NATOA's Community Broadband Hero of the Year last year, and we're here to have him. He's here to talk with us today about uh, the economic development and inclusion aspects of the Lafayette, Louisiana project. Welcome, Joey Durrell. Bonjour. You're supposed to say bonjour back. Bonjour. I guess you're supposed to start off today about talking about being carded. And uh, I got carded for the first time 30 years ago when I was 50. And, um, you know, we, we aged pretty well in South Louisiana because of that good, authentic Cajun cooking. And my wife makes a very mean crawfish etouffee. I've heard a lot of idealistic talking today. I heard a lot of dreams. And it occurs to me that maybe the reason I'm here is to show that these can be reality. Because I think we've accomplished much of what's being talked about today in Lafayette. So I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to tell the story about Lafayette, what we call the city of the future today. Let me make sure, first of all, that everyone here is clear about one thing. Lafayette is a city of about 125,000 people that had all the broadband that any city in America has. This was not about simply getting access to broadband. This initiative was about using broadband to leap into the 21st century. This is about raising the bar in our city. I want to share a story with you so you'll understand why we did what we did. While walking door to door during my campaign for this office, I walked up to a home with a truck and a U-Haul trailer attached to it. As I approached the open door with two ladies standing in the foyer, I asked if they were moving in or if they were moving out. It was a mother and a daughter. After I introduced myself, the mother, with a distraught look in her face, said that her daughter had just finished college and had found a job out of state. Then she said, Mr. Durrell, please, if you get elected, please find a way to get her back home. That was one of my most memorable moments, and I've never forgotten that visit. Like many states, Louisiana has had an out-migration problem. We educate many of our young people to go work in your states. Our fiber project was an opportunity to get out of the box and do something that might create an atmosphere attractive to businesses that could bring good, clean, high-paying jobs, allowing our community to keep their families together. While this was about economic development, 
There are great financial and educational advantages for our citizens. Today, we are delivering a gigabit to our school board, and every public school in our parish gets 100 megabits per second symmetrical. So imagine a third grade French immersion class in Lafayette solving a problem with a third grade class in our sister city, Poitiers, France, while interacting with them over a monitor. Just imagine what that does for them to broaden their cultural horizons. Many try to paint this as a government versus the private sector. I disagree. This was a tremendous free enterprise initiative for Lafayette. We are giving small businesses in Lafayette com a competitive edge and are encu encouraging entrepreneurship in all segments of our community. I've often said that the next great technology entrepreneur might live in a very poor part of our town, and now that person will have the same access and opportunity as anyone else. Newcom, a Canadian call center, came to Lafayette a few years ago and created 1,000 jobs. They started by looking at 200 cities around the globe, but ultimately chose Lafayette. The owner told me that he was attracted to Lafayette simply because we were having the discussion about fiber optics. Then this past year, while Disney was filming the movie Secretariat, Pixel Magic got introduced to Lafayette. They now have an office in Lafayette primarily because of the technology we have to offer. They will be hiring about 40 people to work on the special effects they do in the movie industry. And because of the affordable, high-speed connectivity they will have from homes, they won't have to lease as much office space. But our existing businesses, like architects, engineers, geologists, et cetera, are benefiting from being able to send, being able to send and receive massive files at speeds of up to 100 megabits per second. And as computers improve, we will ramp up the speeds just by simply changing the electronics. One of our major hospitals has put together a group to see how they can take advantage of these speeds to better serve their patients in Lafayette. And so what are our citizens getting? They get 10, 30, or 50 megabits per second. And by the way, I didn't tell you, this is our own citizen-owned utilities company, uh, the Lafayette Utility System, who has been delivering electricity to Lafayette since 1897. So our citizens are getting up to 50 megabits per second symmetrical at very affordable prices. And our peer-to-peer -peer intranet delivers upload and download speeds of 100 megabits per second for free. For slow-speed internet, expanded cable TV, and basic telephone, one would pay in Lafayette $130 a month. With our utility system getting much faster speeds, many more channels, and the same rough, rough base, basic telephone, they're paying $85 a month. So we are saving our citizens money, offering a premium service, and we are already attracting businesses to our community. Today, a child that lives in a home without a computer can Google Christopher Columbus right on the television and do his research without owning a computer. In Lafayette, even the poorest will have easy access to the Internet simply for the cost of television and telephone. We have no digital divide. And by the way, there is no charity. There's no subsidy. Everyone in our community has pride of ownership. A friend tells the story of his son playing one of those computer games where you compete against people all over the world. He was beating everyone pretty handily when at some point someone from the other side of the globe asked him exactly what kind of internet speed are you using. One of the most significant aspects of Lafayette's story is that of inclusion. That is why I believe the single most significant thing anyone can do to speed up the deployment of high-speed broadband in America is to prevent and remove any impediments to municipalities doing exactly what Lafayette is doing. Just give municipalities the legal ability to make their own decisions for their citizens and let them compete. That is what made America great, and we all know that it is competition that will do more for innovation, affordable pricing, and quality of service for our citizens. In six weeks, the citizens of Lafayette will celebrate their fiber network with a three-day conference called FiberFET. At FiberFET, technologists, entrepreneurs, and community leaders from around the world will convene to witness Lafayette's network firsthand to celebrate its rollout and to help us figure out how to exploit the benefits for all of Lafayette citizens. We want Lafayette to become a laboratory for what high-speed broadband can do for everyone in America. So if you know anyone who, has, who needs a 125,000 person test market, please have them give me a call. So on behalf of the city of Lafayette, I would like to invite the commissioners to FiberFET. If you're able to make it, you will see this network that passes in front of every home and business in Lafayette with absolutely no exceptions. A system that is two to ten times faster than that is offered in surrounding towns or anywhere else in Louisiana. At FiberFET, you will see what can be accomplished when barriers to facilities-based competition are removed. 
What you will experience is Lafayette's pride in the fiber optic network we are building together. Where you will be is in Lafayette, the city of this broadband future today. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mr. Drell. Well, thank you, and it's, uh, it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Representative Doris Matsui of California. Uh, before I do, I need to apologize to the Congresswoman about something. Uh, you may have heard the rumors. I'm here to say that they're true. We've been stealing your ideas. <laughs> Your proposal to extend the Universal Service Fund's Lifeline Assistance Program for Universal Broadband is included in our national broadband plan. And I wanted you to find out from me personally rather than through the tabloids. Uh, <laughs> Congressman, Congresswoman Matsui is a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, which oversees the FCC, so you can see why I want to make sure that we're clear on the spirit with which we have shared her ideas. Representing Sacramento, California, and surrounding areas, Congresswoman Matsui has been a leader in Congress on issues ranging from innovation to energy to flood protection. She's a member of the Rules Committee, co-chair of the National Service Caucus, was appointed by the Speaker to serve on the Smithsonian Institution's Board of Regents. Uh, Congresswoman Matsui, as a leader on the Energy and Commerce Committee, a leader in Congress, uh, it's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome Congresswoman Doris Matsui. I uh, would rather hear it from the chairman than from the tabloids. That's really wonderful. Uh, good morning, and um, it's a beautiful morning, and thank you very much for inviting me here today. I thank the FCC and the Knight Foundation for hosting this event to discuss the importance of the digital inclusion and closing the digital divide throughout this wonderful country of ours. And as we all know, in today's economy, the Internet has become a necessity and certainly not a luxury. We certainly, um, this morning as I got into the car and uh, dropped my Blackberry and the little ball fell out. Do you know how important that little ball is? <laughs> Unbelievable. I felt so unconnected. It is really impossible. So we understand how important it is. And um, Americans today need affordable and convenient internet access for educational purposes, to apply for college, to compare health care options, I got that in, health care, to obtain emergency information, and everything in between. And that list will continue to grow and grow as innovation continues. Americans also need broadband services, as we know, to seek job opportunities. In fact, broadband access is key to finding a job in today's economy as about 75% of all U.S. employers now require job seekers to apply online, leaving those without broadband services at a severe disadvantage. So as part of any comprehensive plan to increase broadband access to more Americans, it is really critical that we address the affordability barriers that leave millions of Americans on the wrong side of the digital divide. A recent survey conducted by the FCC found that 93 million Americans, about one-third of the country, are not con connected at all to high-speed Internet at home, in large part due to the high cost of broadband services. Specifically, the survey found that 36 percent, or 28 million Americans, said that they do not have in-home broadband services because the monthly fee is too expensive. And another 10% said the broadband installation fee is just too high. That is nearly half of all American households who want to subscribe to the internet but can't afford the costs. I've heard from many of my constituents in Sacramento who echo these concerns. Just recently from a disabled man who is forced to commute miles to the nearest library 
just to access the Internet. The fact is that far too many lower-income families in urban and rural areas are severely disadvantaged, in large part by the hard, high costs of broadband services. Millions of Americans simply cannot afford to pay the $40 to $60 each month for broadband services, where they are struggling just to make ends meet, especially in today's economy. To help close the digital divide in this country, I've introduced the Broadband Affordability Act, which will direct the FCC to create a program for universal broadband adoption, similar to the current Lifeline Assistance Program within the Universal Service Fund. This legislation will ensure that lower-income Americans have access to affordable broadband services. In doing so, households which currently possess broadband service options but have not subscribed because of costs will no longer be unserved or underserved. A lifeline program for broadband will have significant tangible benefits for lower-income households residing in urban areas. It will also provide greatly benefit consumers in rural areas as more rural telecom providers will build out to unserved areas knowing that there will be more consumers able to afford their services. And as a country, we will all benefit by expanding access to broadband. We never know where the next great idea or invention will come from. And the Internet offers a world of opportunities for individuals to express themselves and be creative and make sure our country stays competitive in a global marketplace. Moving forward, I will continue to work with Chairman Waxman and Boucher and my colleagues to ensure that a path to universal broadband adoption becomes a reality this year. And I also like to applaud Chairman Rockefeller and, and Senator Hutchinson for introducing a similar bipartisan measure in the Senate. And I want to thank the chairman here, because it's my understanding, and you've proven it out to me now today, that the FCC will include a plan for universal broadband adoption similar to my proposal as a central recommendation to increase broadband adoption rates among lower-income households in their upcoming National Broadband Plan recommendation to reform the Universal Service Fund. I applaud the FCC for doing so and for using this historic opportunity to help ensure all Americans have access to affordable broadband services and taking a major step forward toward truly closing the digital divide. I look forward to working with all my colleagues and with the FCC to make this a reality. And I'd like to thank the FCC and the Knight Foundation once again for hosting today's event. And I look forward to the future with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we are now honored to be joined by Congressman Javier Becerra, a ninth-term congressman from Los Angeles. Most people know Congressman Becerra as vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus, one of the senior members of the Ways and Means Committee, a former chairman of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, a major leader in Congress on issues of opportunity for all Americans. But the reason Congressman Becerra is our secret weapon at today's Digital Inclusion Summit is that he is also a summit expert. He was one of a select handful of members to participate in the recent healthcare summit. Rest assured, Congressman, that at uh, today's event will not run nearly as long. And uh, also, you are free to speak as long as you would like. Please welcome Congressman Javier Becerra. Commissioner, I, I sat through those seven hours, and I saw that you've already run through about 12 or 13 speakers, so I won't put you through the pain of any more than necessary. I will say this. To the chairman of the SEC, Chairman Janikowski, to Commissioner Clyburn, to all those who took the time to be here, but most importantly to those who are stakeholders in this effort, let me tell you some personal stories. 
back in the 1960s when my family and I would make annual treks to Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, because my mother was born there. My father came from Jalisco, Mexico as well. We would drive down during the Christmas vacations, and my father would not like to stop because it was an extra day out of the trip, and we'd have to drive all the way down. It was a, about a 2,000-mile drive, and so we would rush through as quickly as we could, all six of us. And periodically, we'd go through stretches in the roads in Mexico, and if you've ever driven through parts of Mexico, it's as isolated and desolate as you can get, especially as, as you're going through Sonora, the Sonoran Desert. And every once in a while, we'd see what looked like a home or a few buildings way out there by themselves. And invariably, what we would find as we would ask our parents about these little buildings, I wouldn't even call them homes, we'd see an antenna sticking up the side of the home. No cars, nothing of that sort, but an antenna. And I remember my mother saying to me, Mijo, una de las cosas que no dejas, one of the th my son, one of the things you'll never let go is your connection to the outside world. And for many of these families, the only connection they had to the rest of the world was that antenna that gave them access to television. Fast forward to 2010. My daughter said to me about two weeks ago, she said, Dad, you know, my friend and I are in this in Spanish class. She's a sixth grader. And there's a new girl in the school. And she's been assigned to us because we speak more Spanish than the rest of our classmates, and she doesn't speak any English or very little. So one of my friends, she said, my friend says it's kind of difficult She's because this girl is always hanging around. And I said to her, you know, we got, I, you know, uh, her name is Natalia. I said, Natalia, you have a very special gift. You get to understand what people say in two different languages. That girl is trying to do the same thing you are. She yearns to be able to go out into the playground and associate with each and every one of you. But right now, she's tethered to the two of you because you're her access to the rest of the school. And so I hope you'll do the best you can to help her out because it wasn't too long ago that my sister, my oldest sister, had to do the same because she knew more Spanish than English when she started in school. There is no child I know of that doesn't yearn to socialize with his or her classmates. There is no family that wants to be removed from what happens with the, with the rest of society. And if the numbers are true, that you're 10 times more likely to use the internet if you've gone to college than if you haven't. And if you're eight times more likely to have access to a computer in your home if you went to college than if you didn't, then today, what I experienced in, 1960, in the 1960s and what my daughter just recollected to me two weeks ago is happening every day in America where there are children and families yearning, yearning to connect to the rest of society, yearning to connect with us. Mr. Chairman, what we're doing in connecting America with broadband is helping those families that are too far away, too distant, whether by miles or language, to be able to communicate with the rest of us. And I say this as someone who is fortunate today to have a daughter who could help that young girl connect, but had a father who had a very difficult time when he was in this country and had asked someone to tell him, what does that sign say outside that restaurant that said no dogs or Mexicans allowed? It's a different world. And we share the responsibility to make sure that all of our children have a chance to participate and to compete. And I believe that when we passed the Econ Economic Recovery and Investment Act in 2009, we knew it was important to find jobs today, but we also knew it was important to find futures for our children for tomorrow. And so that's what this is about. That's why I am pleased to be here. And I tell you this, if we succeed, that little girl, girl will remember not just my daughter, but the fact that this country was willing to make an investment in her 
and we won't have to worry about being so distant that the only way to communicate or to know what's going on in the world is through an antenna. We do this right, we benefit a lot of folks. And so I'm pleased to be here. I'm pleased to join people like Jim Steyer, a great friend of mine, who have committed to this to say, to America's children, we do think of you, we are prepared to commit to you, and we are investing in your future as we speak today. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for including me in this program. Success, let us know how we can help. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank you, Representative Becerra, and I'd also like to point out that I made it through all the Voices of Inclusion speakers without crying. <laughs> and, then, and then you were the one that brought the tears to my eyes. I thought, I, I thought I'd made it through, but not quite. Um, the next section of our program is our question and answer, and um, I would like to invite Elise Kahn, Elise Cohn, Blair Levin, and Brian David up. Elise is going to field the questions. And uh, this is our broadband adoption team, and I'm going to ask you to start by introducing yourselves. Uh, hi, I'm Blair Levin. I'm the executive director of the Omnibus Broadband Initiative at the FCC. I'd like to just very quickly, um, I'd like you to join me in thanking a group of colleagues who are currently burrowed away in a obscure office at the FCC proofing the actual plan. They have been working nonstop for most of the last 180 days, particularly my colleague Eric Garr who very much wanted to be here, but it turns out there's a lot of work to be done in proofing a very long document. So if you could just join me and somehow spiritually he'll hopefully hear this, uh, uh, as well as a dozen other colleagues who really have been doing extraordinary work. I want to thank uh, Brian, Karen, Elise, and the entire adoption team who put this together and who really have been working with a number of stakeholders throughout. Uh, to to make it's not just about the planning process it's what the planning process uh, causes people to do uh, it, the, the the reality of the plan is not just in the words uh, that are currently being proofed there in the actions of many people here and I really want to thank them uh, for working with folks to do that and then finally I want to just mention three folks who I think are in the audience uh, who have been a real inspiration to our team as we started this uh, Graham Richards Graham are you still here uh, former mayor of Fort Wayne, whose uh, use of broadband as mayor really was an inspiration for a lot of us. Uh, Jim Steyer, who has just mentioned Common Sense Media, and Ray Ramsey, uh, who is now TechNet, but uh, previously One Economy. Those are th uh, three experiences that have been very, very important uh, in helping us have better ideas about what to do with broadband. And with that, let me turn it over to Brian. I think I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> um, I'm Brian David. I'm uh, leading up the adoption and use team. Uh, I, if I could just take a quick minute for th that whole team that's here, those of you who are here, just to take a, uh, a moment to recognize you. If you could stand up for a second. Just, I want to thank you because... You all, have, you all have made my life easier in the last six or eight months, and by extension, Julius's and Blair's, and that's good for me as well. What, so. what he's not saying is, I made his life harder, and <laughs> made his life easier. Um, I'm Elise Cohen. I'm the adoption director. And on behalf of the rest of the team, I'm going to um, take this moment and enjoy the chance to turn the tables and ask Brian and Blair questions, <laughs> because for the past several months, they've been asking questions of us. Um, and I also wanted to remind those participating in the audience and at our community viewing sites in Akron, Detroit, Miami, Philadelphia, and Minneapolis, St. Paul, and our virtual attendees online at FCC.gov uh, live to continue to stay engaged. Um, you know that the Knight Foundation works towards informed, engaged communities, and we hope that you'll uh, continue to be engaged in this process and event by submitting questions. Um, questions can be sent via Twitter at hashtag BBplan. And, or by emailing newmedia at fcc.gov or by submitting index cards here at the museum. Um, with that, uh, I'll start with when or why did the term digital divide become digital inclusion and is there a difference? Go ahead. Um, I think we're not trying to coin a new term, but I think um, in some sense the digital divide term, which was important when it began and remains important today in some ways, um, uh, uh, connoted a certain um, split. And what we're trying to say is, in some ways, while that divide exists, we have to bring everyone into this solution. And inclusiveness is, 
is um, the sort of indicative path to get there. Um, and to the degree that we believe all the things we've heard today about the merits of, of, of broadband and the benefits to people, um, bringing people into that as opposed to sort of hauling them over a divide um, is, is an important um, sort of analogy that we, like, we, we wanted to use. Uh, if we label broadband only as infrastructure, are we truly maximizing its potential? Well, one of the things you'll see in the plan is that uh, we are really approaching it from an ecosystem perspective. That is to say, it's not just about the networks. It's about the most important thing about broadband is how people use it. And we think Congressman Markey and the entire Congress was very wise in asking us to focus not just on deployment of networks, but also adoption, how people can use it to improve health care, um, save energy, improve education. So while the underlying infrastructure is absolutely critical, and uh, last week we talked about how to ensure that that infrastructure is everywhere in America, and also how to, how to make it sure that it performs better, um, it's also very important to focus on the actual applications, and that's why I, I want to, uh, again, thank the Knight Foundation for the applications contest that they announced earlier today. We're very excited about that, uh, and we think that that kind of spirit of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation that America does so well ought to be brought to bear on this problem. Um, and so, uh, again, the planning process is not just what's in the several hundred pages of documents that you can all read next week. It's what people are actually doing, like the Knight Foundation. We're very grateful. Thanks. Question from uh, one of our viewers in Akron. How does the FCC plan to address imbalances in regulation between the various forms of carriers when they're essentially providing identical services? Well, let me just answer that very quickly. Last week, we rolled out the universal service framework. One of the things as we move toward a broadband world is to remove those kinds of distinctions that have existed previously with, um, uh, with uh, universal service. The new universal service that we'll be moving toward will be technology neutral. Uh, Blair, shockingly, mm -hmm. despite our, our 30 public notices, Skeets uh -huh. writes, will there be a comment period on the broadband plan in the Federal <laughs> Register? <laughs> Um, well, th there would be, but I have to tell you that uh, one of the people who actually was critical of us early on, and then uh, because he thought there wasn't enough openness after our, I think it was after number 25, he wrote a blog saying, I give up, no more, please don't ask us to answer any more questions. Um, the way it works is this, that uh, the broadband plan is not self-executing. Uh, it makes certain recommendations, uh, about half the recommendations are to the FCC, and then there are to other stakeholders. Uh, in the executive branch as well as to Congress. Every, everything that we recommend requires a further proceeding, um, so there will be plenty of other time for public commentary. Um, one of the uh, viewers here in the room asked what we will be doing to address, uh, to make hardware more affordable for low-income consumers. <laughs> um, they're, they're part of what we're trying to do in the Lifeline link-up um, uh, re revisions that we, again, talked about in terms of universal service uh, reform uh, is to try to figure out how to do that. It's, it's actually a very difficult problem, and one of the things in John Horgan's study I think you'll see is while hardware is a concern, it's probably truer that it's hardware literacy uh, than hardware affordability, particularly as consumer electronics does seem to drive the cost curve down a lot. There are very significant problems of tr figuring out how to effectively subsidize uh, hardware uh, without certain problems administratively and, and, and in other ways. Uh, so we're looking at that. One of the things that we'll, we'll be talking about doing are some test projects. Uh, unfortunately, doing lifeline link up for uh, broadband is very, very different than doing it for uh, phone service. And so you've got to run pilots before you really want to commit large sums of money to it. I would just add to that the the notion that Secretary Donovan mentioned this morning about uh, public-private partnerships collaborating with federal agencies to address a multitude of barriers. Uh, among those, um, and important among those, is computer cost, bringing that down to the point where that is not the most significant barrier to adoption. So we're headed in that direction with those types of ideas as well. Um, Blair, I know you touched on the universal service recommendations, but uh, one of the questions we had is, is, you know, if USF saves Nebraskans $235 a year, can you explain how, how that is a cross-subsidy 
uh, from the rest of the country. Sure. Um, uh, I think we should all be candid about it. I mean, universal service does represent uh, a cross-subsidy from um, American users of communications uh, to those areas, generally speaking, in high-cost areas. That's, that's the largest part of the Universal Service Fund, and that is generally in rural America. Uh, I think we have to be both honest about it, but also recognize that this is what this country has done. It, it did it with um, uh, electricity back uh, during the New Deal. It did it with uh, telephone service, uh, starting really uh, with the 34 Act, but even before that, uh, the concept was uh, one service, uh, one network for the country uh, that would exist everywhere in the country. Uh, we've done this, we, we do this with water projects, we do this with a lot of uh, capital projects where you have the cost being greater where you have uh, per person, where you have fewer people. And so that's, uh, that's a commitment that uh, the country has made. We think it's uh, the right public policy. We think there is bipartisan uh, support for it. Uh, now, how you do it and what the level of subsidy should be, all those are very legitimate questions to ask. Uh, but we do think that, uh, again, e pluribus unum um, is, is the watchword of kind of our, our approach to this. Um, I do want to say that Brian's most often asked questions is when will we be done? <laughs> when, will, when will the draft be done? Um, so we are uh, going to go through the questions we have, but if there are questions from the room, please pass those in on uh, index cards. Um, can you all touch on the recommendations in the plan for regional and local capacity building? Sure. And how will the national plan support states? Okay, great. So I, I think what we'll what, what, what you will see next week um, is the recognition that um, this is not a sort of federally imposed policy and plan that, that um, many people have, have called for, and we recognize that the work happens at the local level. Commissioner Clyburn mentioned local. It's very important that it be done that way. There is no one solution to any of these things. The the sort of ecosystem of uh, of people in the other room are are just one indication of how many different approaches to very similar problems uh, can be can be executed in a successful way. Uh, so what we what we are saying though in in the plan is that um, at the state level, in many in many cases, there's a gap where uh, there isn't the the uh, sort of capacity to to execute state level planning and then prompt and manage local initiatives uh, for those things that matter and th there is some funding allocated within the broadband data improvement act uh, and what we're recommending is that that which has not been spent on what well, was essentially mapping grants in the last year um, be spent on building this state and local capacity to um, to really execute at the local level the types of things that the the community and the, the national plan itself uh, see as the roadmap going forward. There's one word missing from today's discussion: security or cybersecurity. Will the FCC include secure digital citizen as a goal for improving digital literacy for all Americans? Um. Uh, y yes, that will be discussed in the plan. Uh, it's actually very, very important. And again, one of the things that John Horgan's study suggested to us was that if you look at the question of utilization, uh, as well as the question of getting people online, one of the big barriers both to adoption but also to utilization is a people's sense that their data is not secure or in some ways the network uh, can be invaded. And so we will have some discussion of that. I will say that that is one area. We, w the, the, the closer uh, the recommendations are to the FCC, the more granular and detailed the recommendations you're going to find. Uh, but it's very clear that there are, there are a lot of different stakeholders in the government who are working on that, and we want to kind of point in the direction that we think is appropriate. But that obviously is something of, of great concern uh, to this country, and, and we, we applaud the efforts of others in the government to really drive that ball forward. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from Twitter, both are, are 
addressing what we can say, you know, is the most hopeful thing to someone in rural America who's stuck with dial-up and no cell service. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the most hopeful thing to say is that we have a plan, uh, and that that plan, uh, we are very cognizant of the 7 million American homes that do not have access to broadband, that our plan, which, again, we'll, uh, we, we talked about publicly Friday, but we'll talk in more de detail on next Tuesday, is a plan to make sure that uh, all American homes have uh, broadband that enables them to do uh, what most Americans are doing today in terms of, uh, and it's much, much better than dial-up. It's not easy. It will take some time. Uh, we are not doing it by uh, causing f further um, increases in the contribution factor, which uh, for those of you schooled in the arcane rules of uh, universal service, you know that that's uh, the, the contribution factor is already at a record high. So we're going to make some tough decisions about how to shift resources to make sure those 7 million American homes get linked, but we will have a plan to do that. And, and uh, there are other recommendations that sort of that address rural areas, um, either directly or, or um, tangentially. Among them, the, the, again, the notion of these partnerships with federal agencies, um, the plan will recommend that the Department of Agriculture uh, be one of those agencies with whom uh, that third sector and the private sector work to um, to serve that community with the, whatever mechanism and tools um, as a as a collaboration they can agree makes sense. Um, can you talk about some of the recommendations we have for other demographic groups, such as seniors, or um, obviously tomorrow we'll go into more depth on people with disabilities? But yeah, so tomorrow will be um, you know a full. Um, full detailing of, of the, the disability recommendations, uh, which Elizabeth Lyle has, has uh, done an incredible job putting together. Um, with respect to other, um, other groups, I think uh, what, what you will see is a recognition across all of the recommendations, um, but I'll focus on a few. Digital Literacy Core, uh, real recognition that, again, it has to be local, and in, in that vein, it's going to specifically probably target those under adopting groups, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, and low income as a, as a general matter, and that, um, that it should, in its local implementation, orient in that direction if we're going to solve the, the lag that we're trying to solve. Um, that will also be true for, for um, a series of other recommendations uh, where we want to leverage that local activity. Um, to sort of energize those communities and help them, again, be part of the inclusive solution. What strategies have you considered to educate all Americans on the benefits and necessities of being online, appreciating that one size doesn't fit all? Um, we actually, as we, as we looked at the survey data, uh, there is certainly some need for some of that, but we actually think that... Um, that's not the single biggest barrier. That's not where the, f the focus uh, needs to be. Um, obviously, there is, there is some kind of uh, very targeted ways in which uh, those benefits need to be made uh, more real. And again, uh, going to how we started uh, this morning's um, effort, what the Knight Foundation is doing is trying to figure out how to uh, create some applications that make that need more valuable. I mean, people will do what is in their interest to do. One of the m one of the most important kind of moments intellectually in this project came when Ray Ramsey, who was then at One Economy, said, you know, said to us the obvious, but at an important point. Nobody uses broadband for broadband's sake. They use broadband to do their taxes more effectively. They use broadband to do their homework, et cetera. So if we have, if the applications are developed for the community of non-adopters, uh, if we can show greater value, because value is not always just a function of price, it's also a function of, of the benefits that you get. Uh, we think that'll come and that that's more important. One of the things about the plan is that it says, you know, it makes choices, that you, you want to focus attention in one direction and maybe not in another. And while um, public recognition is important, that's not really where the challenge is today, not the biggest challenge. Um. We've got a number of questions, Blair. I wonder if you can just touch. It's not a oh, little this bit. This is a lightning round. Where we <laughs> <laughs> this is the lightning round. Uh, I, I, I also, I don't want to keep people late, but go um, ahead. Well, no, that goes to Brian's favorite question. <laughs> um, but can you just touch on, uh, you know, to what level of detail we've, we've mapped access, the city, county, or, or zip? I know it's not. 
I'm sorry. To what level? Uh, can you just touch a little bit on the um, deployment side and on the mapping efforts with driver's lead? Yeah, we, uh, we, we, we did a lot of modeling uh, and forecasting in the, in the development of the universal service recommendations, but the real mapping that's going to be done by the FCC is going to be done in conjunction with NTIA and we'll be due in about a year. Um, and uh, also just kind of, I think this will probably be the last one, but at a high level, can you go over some of uh, competition? Sure. Uh, there's a number of different recommendations that focus on uh, how to improve the competitive uh, uh, nature of uh, the, the marketplace. Uh, for example, one of the things about any healthy competitive marketplace is it requires certain transparency about what people are actually getting. Um, uh, and so one of the things we have been doing a great deal of work on, and, and you can expect to hear more about it, is how do you make it more transparent to folks about what level of performance both they are getting, but also that is available in their area. And this will become increasingly tr important as, you, as, as the market develops different kinds of performances and as the kind of the difference between getting five and getting 20 megabits uh, becomes more important. Secondly, very importantly, we've really focused a lot on spectrum. Um, we don't know how the market, no one knows how the market is actually going to develop, but there's no doubt that if we don't have more spectrum in the marketplace, the ability for uh, spectrum-based uh, competitors to develop competition with uh, wired is, is lessened. So it's really important to get more spectrum out there. Uh, there are certain things such as with set-top boxes. Uh, that are in the plan that are helping to develop new forms uh, and ways of competition. It's a complicated c question in part because there's competition not, not just um, coming on, on the infrastructure side that we were talking about earlier, but we need to make sure there's a healthy ecosystem of competition all around. But there'll be a lot of discussion about that in the plan. And I know that wasn't today's topic, but we had a lot of questions. Um, on that, I want to thank everybody in the audience and viewing in the different locations online uh, for your questions. And I know there's some that we didn't get to today, but uh, we hope that you'll continue the conversation on broadband.gov through our blog. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And if I just one last commercial interruption uh, uh, announcement. So tomorrow is uh, disability access, and then Friday we'll be doing uh, a kids summit and talking about the importance of broadband in kids. Thanks. Well, I think. Uh, Alberto and I are now um, going to try to wrap up this extraordinary day. Uh, I think the first and most important thing to do after um, listening to these incredible presentations and discussion is to begin uh, where I started, by talking about the incredible team at the FCC that's been working around the clock uh, uh, on this effort. Um, you saw some of the key members today, Karen, Elise, Brian, uh, Roger Goldblatt has been here, others. Uh, uh, it's just been an extraordinary privilege for me to see the passion and the brilliance with which all of these folks have thrown themselves into this topic of such great importance to the country and of such uh, uh, difficulty. Um, uh, um, most important, uh, I want to thank and acknowledge uh, the general of our efforts, uh, our Yoda, Blair Levin, uh, who uh, has no, it's true. Uh, who uh, who has um, uh, come back? Any resemblance is purely coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, Blair was a foot taller when this thing started. Yeah. Uh, Blair came back to public service from a very successful private sector career because of how important this project was, and I think we're beginning to see the fruits uh, of that. We'll see it for a very long time. And I wanted to ask everyone to acknowledge the work of Blair Levin and the broadband team. Uh, we've really had an incredible uh, day of speakers. Some of you came in in the middle uh, to be joined by uh, our Housing and Urban Development Secretary, Sean Donovan, uh, for those inspiring remarks at the beginning of the day. Uh, so many members uh, of Congress who are here uh, from both parties, 
uh, sharing in the recognition of the importance of this effort uh, and the need for a real plan to actually deliver on these goals for the country. Um, this incredible group, uh, the Voices of Inclusion, um, uh, I hope each of you had a chance to hear from these remarkable individuals talk about their experiences. Um, uh, they will live forever on the internet, and so if you didn't see it, I really encourage you to hear directly from people who have uh, benefited directly from broadband access, from digital literacy, uh, uh, and also some of the great innovators in the country uh, in uh, 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 putting this to work. Uh, I'm so pleased that we had uh, Joey Durrell from, um, uh, from Lafayette. Uh, uh, thank you, Ted Olson, uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you to um, uh, Jim Steyer and Ray Ramsey and Graham Richard for all your work in this area. Uh, and of course, um, uh, thank you to my colleagues. Uh, I'm so glad that Commissioner Copps and Commissioner Baker came here today uh, and you see uh, the importance of this project to the full commission. Uh, and I particularly want to thank Commissioner Clyburn for very powerful, forceful remarks today on the importance of digital inclusion, the need for a plan, and the fact of a plan. Um, finally, uh, uh, Alberto and the, and the Knight Foundation, thank you so much for co-hosting this uh, with us, co-hosting this with us today, for announcing the competition that you did. Uh, we see the benefits of the great team uh, you have, uh, uh, Damian and uh, Thorman and George Martinez and Mark Fest and others. We really appreciate all the hard work that's gone uh, into this. Uh, let me briefly and impossibly try to sum up a little bit of what I heard today. Um, from this very broad collection of speakers um, with different backgrounds and different perspectives on the challenge and opportunity. One is, I think we were reminded today about the vital importance of broadband to economic success, to broad opportunity. I think you know where I learned that term. Uh, we saw how essential broadband is to every American to participate in our economy, to participate in our democracy, to have access to uh, the benefits of health care in a 21st century world, education in a 21st century world, public safety, etc. Uh, so we were reminded about the importance of the goals of universal broadband and then we were reminded about uh, some of the real challenges. The U.S. is lagging behind. Uh, broadband is essential to our global competitiveness as a country. It's essential for us to be able to remain the world leader in innovation in all of these important areas for job creation, for economic success, and for innovation and education and healthcare, care, et cetera. But we're lagging behind. And then we heard that in America, Different communities are lagging behind. Rural Americans, minorities, seniors, Americans with disabilities, uh, tribal parts of our country, low-income Americans, the gap between average access and their access is too high, even though our average access isn't high enough, our access and our adoption and our usage. Uh, third, we heard uh, in very real terms about the very high costs of digital exclusion and the fact that they're growing. We heard that if you want to find a job today, you need to be online. Very different from 10 years ago when, as one of our speakers said, broadband was a convenience. Uh, not having high-speed access was an inconvenience. Uh, today, if you want to find a job, you need to be online. Today, if you want your kids to get the full benefits of educational opportunities in the 21st century, if you're a parent who wants to participate with their kids, exercise responsibility, and help your kids succeed, you need the Internet. If you want to uh, benefit from health care in the 21st century, you need to have broadband access. It goes on and on. The list, uh, the list is long. The cost of exclusion are high and growing. I thought that was a very clear message from our speaker today. And finally, um, uh, we heard what the uh, broadband team will recommend uh, in its plan. 
uh, uh, in just a few days. I couldn't be more excited about these initiatives to tackle this incredible challenge around uh, 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 the need for digital inclusion, uh, tackling some of the hard issues around our universal service fund, uh, setting up a digital literacy core, uh, following through on the idea from Congresswoman Matsui, who was here today, and Senator Rockefeller and Senator Hutchison, to update our Lifeline program so that it applies to broadband, uh, thinking very creatively about uh, national and local public-private partnerships. Uh, it's been, uh, I think, uh, uh, an important day as part of an important project. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues at the FCC, everyone at the FCC, we're very happy to be uh, included in this uh, with you. Uh, thank you again, Alberto, for uh, the work that you personally do and the Knight Foundation does in shedding light on, uh, as Ted Olson reminded us, the information needs of communities, every community in the country, uh, this vital service of information and the vital role that it plays in our economy and in our country's future. So thank you. It's a pleasure to participate. Thank you. We look forward to the next steps and I'm more than pleased to give you the last word. Thanks. I, um, I, 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 I'll just join all of the thank yous that, uh, that you gave and, and associate myself with, with your remarks. I do have, I really am sore though, because the, the, the first hour and a half of this conversation had everything to do with people who claim to be too young, to, to, who look too young for the responsible positions they have, and nobody mentioned that I must be too young for the, <laughs> the, 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 the reality is that the last time I was carded, I actually figured it out, was 26 years ago um, at the Long Island Coliseum for a hockey game, and I gave the kid $5 for making my day. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I really do appreciate uh, all of you being here. Thank you, Julius, for your leadership, for your vision, uh, for the courage of your convictions, because I know this is not new for you. This is a long, long time, long held belief uh, that, uh, that all Americans deserve universal access. I love the fact that we were talking about practicalities, that we were talking about real people who have real needs and have taken real opportunity uh, through through the use of uh, of the technology that we're talking about cities like Omaha and Lafayette that aren't simply just talking about it but are actually uh, doing things for the benefit of their of their citizens I think Jack Knight would have been extraordinarily pleased with what he what he might have heard uh, today. He would be skeptical too, because Jack Knight was not a guy who particularly liked Washington, or particularly liked anything to do with government as an old old style uh, newspaper man. But I think it is really important to remember that we're talking about building a network. We are not talking about content. We are talking about teaching people media literacy. We're not telling them what to read or what to think. This is enabling. This is inclusion. Um, and I think this is really, really important work. The last thing I'd like to say is that I, I would be remiss as, uh, as chairman of the board of the museum if I did not invite you to immediately go downstairs and go through the museum. It is a fantastic um, uh, institution dedicated to free speech and, uh, and free press. Uh, I think you'd all have uh, a wonderful time. It's a great way to spend the afternoon. Julius, you have nothing to do. Um, <laughs> I'll personally escort you through the, uh, through the be a reporter. You can record something, send it to your mother. It would be, it'd be fantastic. I, I hope you've enjoyed the day as much as we have. Thank you all very much for participating. Thank you.